changed. All right. Uh, we will uh, call the meeting to uh, to order and just to remind uh, people again, uh, welcome to uh, meeting number 47, the second panel of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Finance. We are meeting on government spending, we charity and the Canada Student uh, Service Grant. Uh, and on this panel, uh, we uh, would welcome uh, Katie Telford, the uh, Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister. And I believe she has about a 10 minute uh, opening remarks uh, and uh, a two hour session, I believe is, a, am I correct on that? Okay, uh, so we'll go there and I'll turn over the floor to you. I might say to the clerk before we start, uh, Ms. Telford, that uh, the, uh, I already got blacked out uh, once today. There is an unbelievable uh, thunder and lightning storm here. Uh, if it happens again, you'll know, you will know why. Uh, so we'll turn it over to you, uh, Ms. Telford, to welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, members of the Finance Committee. I'd first like to thank all of you for your important work and for giving me the opportunity to answer your questions on the implementation of the Canada Student Service Grant here today. Let me start by saying this is a remarkable time. And from the day that we learned a Canadian had contracted COVID-19, to what is happening during the time period you're interested in, this pandemic that we are still fighting represents a once in a generation challenge for our country. I started working for the Prime Minister uh, after my mat leave and what a journey it has been. I ran his leadership campaign in 2012-13 and went on to lead the 2015 campaign and I've been his chief of staff ever since. And unbelievably, my son just turned nine. So some of you may know that I'm a person interested in data. And uh, data has always helped me assess what we are doing well and what we need to do better. And these past few months, every day, I was waking up to, we were all waking up to, some very alarming statistics. They were more than statistics. Hundreds of people dead because of COVID-19. Hundreds of thousands of people applying for the CERB because they lost their job. Millions of families going through a really tough time. Millions of women in lower wage jobs being especially hurt. Women's participation in our economy is being set back. And every day, daily projections were telling us and still tell us that if we weren't and aren't successful in slowing the spread of the virus, things would get much, much worse. Le travail du Premier ministre consiste à venir en aide aux Canadiens dans le besoin. Mon travail en tant que chef de cabinet est de l'appuyer dans tout ce qu'il fait. Je travaille dans le monde politique depuis un bon moment maintenant, et cette pandémie représente un défi comme nul autre auparavant. Mais c'est aussi vraiment gratifiant pour moi d'avoir l'opportunité de faire une différence dans la vie des gens. Depuis le début de la crise, nous avons annoncé une foule de mesures pour protéger la santé des Canadiens, aider ceux qui ont perdu leur emploi et préparer la relance de notre économie. We acted as fast as we could, knowing we might make mistakes along the way because people were really struggling. So we needed to move quick. Take the emergency response benefit or the Canada emergency wage subsidy. We'd already announced these programs when we realized we needed to make them more accessible, more generous, simpler. But job one was get these programs out the door to help people. When we realized that improvements were needed, we made changes. The CERB and the wage subsidy has since helped millions of Canadians right across the country. Back in April, our government announced a $9 billion plan to help young people get through the pandemic. It included measures such as the Canada Emergency Student Benefit, differing student loans, and yes, the Canada Student Summer Grant. I wanna go back to the first time we discussed a potential aid package for students. On April 5th, there was a meeting by phone, as they all were at this time, between the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister. It was a stock take on the entirety of our government's ongoing economic response to the pandemic. There were 15 different decision points on the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy that Sunday evening, and it was being announced the next day. That was the focus of the call. We also talked about an orphan well program for Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland to help workers in the energy sector who have been hit especially hard by the crisis. At the end of that conversation, the finance minister spoke about gaps he had identified in existing programs like the CERB. We knew that some people were still falling through the cracks. People like seniors, 
seasonal workers, and yes, students. At the time, the Ministry of Finance was thinking about some form of financial assistance, more Canada summer jobs, and a moratorium on student loan payments. We also talked about using the Canada Service Corps to encourage and support young people who want to volunteer and help their community during this pandemic. That was a very brief part of a larger conversation, and everyone agreed that there was more work to do. Just a few weeks later, after a lot of hard work by many people across the government, the Prime Minister announced a $9 billion aid package for students, which included the items I just listed. The Canada Summer Student Grant Program was one-tenth of that package. Quand je repense à la période dont il est question, c'est à la fin avril que la fonction publique nous a communiqué dans une note de brefage la possibilité d'avoir recours à un organisme externe pour mettre en œuvre le programme de bourse pour le bénévolat étudiant. Des questions avaient été soulevées concernant la capacité du gouvernement à mettre en œuvre un tel programme. Et si on pouvait directement verser aux étudiants une compensation financière. Mais c'est seulement le 8 mai que j'ai vu pour la première fois avec le Premier ministre, la proposition de la ministre de la Diversité, de l'Inclusion et de la Jeunesse, selon laquelle l'organisme uni allait mettre en œuvre le programme. La recommandation émise par la fonction publique avait été examinée et approuvée par le comité du cabinet le 5 mai, et nous l'avons vue pour la première fois quelques instants avant la rencontre du cabinet en date du 8 mai, durant laquelle la recommandation devait être ratifiée. Comme le Premier ministre l'a dit dans sa déclaration, nous avions tous les deux des préoccupations. C'est donc pourquoi, le 8 mai, nous avons retiré la bourse pour le bénévolat étudiant de l'agenda du comité. Le Premier ministre, dont l'engagement auprès des jeunes précède son entrée en politique, et moi-même, avions des questions. On voulait plus d'informations concernant l'efficacité d'un tel programme et l'emploi d'un organisme externe pour le mettre en œuvre. Et en toute honnêteté, on se souciait aussi de la perception des gens. On opère dans l'arène politique et c'est important la façon dont nos décisions sont perçues. Nous avons cherché l'assurance de la fonction publique. CUNY était belle et bien la seule organisation qui pouvait mettre en œuvre le programme et que sans l'ombre de doute, UNI était le bon partenaire pour cette initiative. Lorsque la note de financement a été approuvée, le premier ministre a ajouté un dispositif supplémentaire en disant que la ministre devra écrire au président du Conseil du Trésor pour accéder à plus de financement si le programme prenait de l'expansion. This proposal to help students was recommended by the public service. This was not a choice between different organizations to deliver the program. This was a choice between going forward with the program or not. I will add that we had previously received the Ethics Commissioner's approval for Sophie Gregoire Trudeau's work engagement with the WE charity, so I wasn't aware of any conflicts. You have heard the Prime Minister say that he regrets not recusing himself. I have regrets about that too. Obviously, this didn't happen as we intended to, and this is not what we had envisioned, and I share in that responsibility. Over the past few weeks, I have thought a lot about this program. I have thought about what we could do better and how we could apply lessons we've learned going forward. In hindsight, I recognize that while we did ask many questions to make this program a success, we could have done better. We could have done more. We could have added yet another layer of scrutiny to avoid any potential perception of favoritism. Mr. Chair, I work with a team of committed, hardworking individuals. We're not perfect, but we are committed to being better and to doing more. And perhaps most importantly right now, we remain committed to serving and supporting as many Canadians as we can, as quickly as we can. As the daughter of retired public servants, I have the utmost respect, not only for public service, but for those who choose it as a career. And I wanna take this moment to thank them and my colleagues for the work they continue to do under especially challenging circumstances. I believe that we all get into public service to help others. And what a time for all of us to be doing that. We thought renegotiating NAFTA was a challenge. Well, this pandemic, I am sure, is the challenge of our generation and of my life. To have the chance to take up this work during this time with this team under the leadership of this prime minister has been and remains a privilege. With that, I'm pleased to take your questions. 
Thank you uh, very much, Ms. Tilford. Uh, the uh, first, uh, the first round of questions I have on my uh, list uh, for the six-minute round is uh, Mr. Barrett, uh, Ms. Sirowitz, Mr. Fortin, and Mr. Julian. Uh, Mr. Barrett, uh, you're on. Six minutes is yours. Ma'am, this committee passed a motion calling on the Prime Minister to testify for three hours. This meeting is the only one listed in his schedule for today. Frankly, I find it a bit uh, disrespectful to Canadians that he couldn't uh, find a couple extra hours to answer questions. Why couldn't the Prime Minister respect the House of Commons and attend for the full time today? I don't know whether that's on the uh, topic, but we'll uh, let it go, Ms. Telford. I believe, um, Mr. Chair, that the Prime Minister not only accepted the invitation and was pleased to come before the committee, but uh, and originally the invitation for, was for one hour, which he accepted, and, uh, and then he extended his time and stayed for just over 90 minutes. Will you schedule him to attend the remaining time requested? I, I believe that is perhaps a discussion for another time, Mr. Barrett. So this is the third time the Prime Minister is under investigation for breaking ethics laws. He's already been found guilty twice of breaking the law. And uh, well, we'll see what's going to happen a third time, though we did hear an admission from the Prime Minister today that he ought to have uh, recused himself. So we know the regard the Prime Minister has for ethics laws. It's, it's been referred to, I recall, as Harper's Law. So why is it that this Prime Minister thinks that he's above the law? Uh, I am going to uh, just to take a moment here, Ms. Telford, the, uh, the relevance here. Uh, and I remind members again, we are here to examine how much the government spent in awarding the 912 million sole source contract to We Charity and how the outsourcing of the Canada Student Service Grant to We Charity proceeded as far as it did. did. Sure. I will allow that question. Go ahead, uh, Ms. Telford. Well, first of all, when you suggest that there was an admission in his um, in his remarks and his answers to your many questions earlier, I would just want to correct you in saying that actually it's something he said to Canadians some time ago now. And um, I believe that the Prime Minister and our entire office and government take ethics extremely strongly. It make it's a very important thing for us. And it's why we go back and forth with the Ethics Commissioner's Office all the time, and we fully cooperate with anything the Ethics Commissioner asks us to, uh, to look into or to do. Back to Mr. Barrett. Well, I, I mean, he's been, found, he's been found guilty of breaking the act twice. I know that the back and forth goes on often, and that's because he's been under investigation so many times. Uh, did, uh, as his chief, did you read the act after the first time he was found guilty of breaking it? I've actually read the act before that, um, but uh, when you say that's, again, you're suggesting that the reason we're going back and forth with the Ethics Commissioner's Office was for reasons that, yes, that was the case, but we also go back and forth with the Ethics Commissioner's Office all the time, whether it's annual disclosures or questions, because we want to make sure we're getting the interpretations uh, that that do also change over time, as at, we, that we interpret things as accurately as possible, as often as possible. Mr. Baird. After March 1st, how many times did the PMO communicate with the Kielbergers or any of their intermediaries? Uh, so there were, I looked into this, I, um, and uh, there were a handful of interactions with the Prime Minister's Office and the WE organization um, around the Canada Summer Student Grant between uh, then and the launch of the program. There was only one in uh, prior to the, the launch period of the program. It was in early May, um, where one of the policy staff did what is very, very normal in their job, which is to speak to stakeholder organizations. And it was a very general discussion, and they actually redirected the stakeholder, the WE organization, to ESDC officials, which was the um, more appropriate place to be able to get answers for the questions they were asking. We'll let it come back to Mr. Barrett. And I didn't outline at the beginning, uh, uh, Ms. Telford, that uh, we are under what we call the COVID-19 rules. We try and keep the answers as tight uh, to the questions as we can, or I try to, and sometimes I succeed. Mr. Barrett, I won't take that time from you. Go ahead. And what day did that interaction occur, ma'am? I believe it was on May 5th. Okay. The, um, and, and are you able to tell us which policy staffer uh, made that inquiry? I was a member of the policy team. Okay. 
So the Prime Minister uh, claims today that his staff were working on the program before uh, May 8th. Can you provide this committee a list of everyone that was involved? Like, a, can you furnish the committee in writing uh, with, with everyone that was involved in the decision? It's public information who all the staff in the Prime Minister's office are, and I'm here to represent all of those staff as the senior most member of the, uh, of the Prime Minister's office. So if you have questions about any of them or for any of them, I'm happy to take them today. Okay, well, the Prime Minister testified today that the option given to the Cabinet was we or nothing, and uh, which was ultimately the outcome, was, was nothing. And why, did, why did the Cabinet accept uh, this supposed binary choice? Why not ask for options? You know, is this uh, a government run by the public service or is it run by cabinet? Because the accountability rests with the, the head of government. It rests with the cabinet. So um, I, I, I'm getting pretty frustrated hearing, you know, how much respect uh, that uh, the members of cabinet have for the public service while throwing them under the bus instead of taking accountability for their decisions. So um, why, why wouldn't uh, they have required options? So I want to just address two things you said there. One is not trying to, uh, no one is throwing anyone under the bus here. Um, I'm explaining and I'm happy to explain what happened. And we relied on the public service and their recommendations and their recommendation was to proceed. And the question you're asking around, you know, you being frustrated, it was a binary choice. That was exactly the kind of question that the prime minister and I were asking on May 8th, which caused it to be pulled from the cabinet agenda that morning so that we could confirm that that was truly the case. Last question, uh, Mr. Barrett. Since uh, from March 1st uh, until now, um, when did you speak with the Prime Minister about the WE organization? I, on May 8th uh, was when we first learned that the WE organization was being proposed as the organization to deliver and administer this program. And so that is when we spoke about it. Uh, thank you uh, both. Uh, we'll turn now to uh, Ms. Zerowitz for uh, six minutes, followed by Mr. Fortin. Uh, Ms. Zerowitz. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Telford, for joining us today. Uh, we really are grateful. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we always remember to thank our, our ministers, our prime minister, our bureaucrats, uh, but we often forget the amazing team of people uh, that sit in the uh, prime minister's office. So I wanna say a huge thanks to you and to the amazing team there. I can only imagine how crazy the last few months have been. So thank you for your extraordinary effort. Um, my first question is, you. You rightly talked about how we've gone through an un unprecedented time and the impact to Canadians has been extraordinary. Um, you know, we have asked our politicians, our civil servants, our, our staff to work at an extraordinary pace to deliver over 70 emergency programs at a spend of over $200 billion. And this is just a general question. Were there any additional processes uh, put in place or any special oversight mechanisms because of the increased level of spending and the speed of the decision making? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think uh, I think that's actually one of the things I've been reflecting on, and uh, the team has been reflecting on in this in this last period of time is that is whether there is additional rigor that could be play, put in place even in a time of crisis. Our focus, uh, for the reasons you said and the reasons I said in my opening statement, has been on getting support to Canadians as quickly as we can and to as many as we can. And um, that does not mean, and that is why we also held up the proposal on May 8th, that rigor does not need to be applied. And we know that rigor has been being applied by the public service throughout, by staff and ministers' offices and ministers throughout. But uh, obviously things have moved in compressed time periods and, and, and thus you know, the, the time isn't necessarily spent in the same ways as in the past. And we need to think about how to ensure we continue to have rigor uh, as you would in a normal time in a time of crisis as well. Thank you for that. Um, my next question is, there's a lot of questions that come up uh, at our committee around uh, the change in the WE board, the uh, layoffs that took place, whether or not we had registered themselves as, as a lobbyist or not. And, uh, uh, and we have heard uh, that uh, the bureaucrats have uh, 
that we have a lot of confidence that our bureaucrats have uh, done their due diligence. Uh, my question to you is, um, is just I, I just want to make sure that Canadians understand that there is the, what's the responsibility of the bureaucrats versus uh, what actually comes to to cabinet. If you could just, just maybe elaborate on that, I'd be grateful. And I think just one more point I want to make, just because I think there was a little bit of misinformation. Uh, we did receive from Rachel Warnick that there were eight organizations that were actually assessed by ESDC officials to potentially deliver CSSG. And we also heard that ESDC officials held two calls with Canada Service Corps uh, to see whether or not they could actually uh, to discuss this particular program. But anyways, if you could just maybe talk so that people can understand that division. So in terms of, I, I think obviously the, um, the department that is presenting the uh, memorandum to cabinet, along with departments that work, because many different departments, especially in this time, everyone was rolling up their sleeves and working on a number of different projects at once and supporting different departments were supporting each other um, with their work in, in truly unprecedented ways. Um, what ultimately comes to cabinet is a memorandum to cabinet that summarizes those recommendations, summarizes the due diligence that has been done. And it was there that we saw that the recommendation that said that there is, um, that there is this one organization that is able to deliver this organization, uh, to deliver this program. Uh, I, I think you know one of the differences is there are all kinds of briefing notes uh, that go back and forth between departments on all kinds of details within it that we're looking at some of those assessments that you describe and that I believe you've had officials, well, I know you've had officials who have come to committee and described them. And um, there, there's all kinds of work done between, uh, between ministers' offices and departments leading up to that memorandum of cabinet that then summarizes the, uh, the information they've put together and makes a recommendation to cabinet. Thank you. My next question is, um, I know that there was uh, a lot of um, anxiousness to ensure that um, the, the programs uh, for youth uh, were, um, were accelerated as fast as possible. Can you describe to us what is your understanding of uh, what was behind the Prime Minister's motivation to deliver the program as fast as possible? Uh, and that was the uh, CSSG program, as well as all the other student programs that were introduced. Look, going back to the uh, April 5th uh, conversation that I referenced, um, and it was it was a relatively brief conversation, but it it does kind of, I think, summarize an answer uh, to, to what you're asking. We talked about the fact that there were gaps in our existing programs and that there were certain populations, key parts of our population that weren't yet getting the support that they needed. Uh, as I mentioned, we talked about, we've talked about seniors, we've talked about seasonal workers, uh, and we've and we talked about in that case students. And when it came to students, we talked about students first and foremost. Job one uh, was, you know, how do we help those students who all of a sudden found themselves uh, heading into summer because we were and hit, not only was there a pandemic, it was the end of their school year, mm -hmm. uh, or it was about to be soon. Uh, and so, how do we help those students who had rent to pay, who needed to put groceries on the table? And then our second uh, objective, but a, a very important one, was we were starting to already see research and, um, and stories being told and people telling us directly about the impact. And I know I heard some members talking about this um, in, uh, in the committee with the Prime Minister earlier as well, uh, that you all recognize, because you hear it from your constituents, I know, of you know, the concerns around mental health for young people, the concern about wanting to make sure that we don't have a last last generation here where they they have to spend years catching up from this from this this period of time and so we wanted to see what ways we could ensure that we were connecting young people to their communities and encouraging people to be innovative in that regard and this has we're, been something the prime minister's talked about for a long time as we're well we're going to have so. to move on here uh, uh miss telford uh turning then to uh mr fortin uh for yep. six minutes uh Riel. Merci, M. le Président. Euh, Madame Telford, euh, le premier ministre s'est déjà fait prendre deux fois là, euh, à, à déroger aux règles d'éthique, une fois avec le cas de la GACAN, une autre fois avec SNC-Lavalin. Il y a eu d'autres aventures. Quand c'est venu le temps de se prononcer sur le dossier de We Charity au début, le premier ministre nous dit « j'ai reporté la rencontre, la décision à plus tard parce que je n'étais pas confortable » et vous nous confirmez que c'était le cas. Là, vous sentiez qu'il y avait une possibilité de conflit d'intérêts. Comment vous nous expliquez qu'il se fasse encore prendre la main dans le plat de biscuits après tous ces drapeaux rouges qui sont devant lui.
Mr. Chair, I have to reject what the member is saying in terms of uh, what what uh, what happened here. Other than the, your opening comments, uh, sir, which were that uh, the Prime Minister did have concerns at the May 8th uh, meeting when he was first briefed on this, and he said he wanted to get more by way of briefing, and that's what he did. Et après avoir reçu ces nouvelles informations-là, là, il était rassuré. Il croyait qu'il n'y avait plus de conflit d'intérêts. Pourtant, aujourd'hui, vous êtes dedans, là, pas à peu près. Là. Qu comment vous expliquez ça? We were reassured that this program was the, the, the only way that this program could happen this summer in this unprecedented time was for the WE organization to administer it and deliver it. And that was the reassurance we were given. There was, um, and, uh, and at that point, it was determined to proceed. Pourtant, le président de la fonction publique nous a dit que la fonction publique aurait très bien pu administrer ce programme-là. Vous n'êtes pas d'accord avec lui? I'm sorry, uh, what? Ms. Uh, uh, Telford, I believe uh, uh, Mr. Fortan and might not have come through in translation. It was the uh, president of the Public Service Alliance, I believe, was it not, uh, Riel, uh, that said they could deliver it? That That's was the right. question. The president of the Public Service Alliance uh, indicated they could uh, that the public service could deliver it. Why not? So what we were what we were briefed at the time um, is uh, in uh, and actually on more than one occasion at that time during that period was and, and it was based on other experiences at the time was that this was the only way the program could be delivered uh, for this summer. Mais M. Trudeau savait qu'il y avait un conflit d'intérêts. Le 8 mai, il dit on ne prendra pas la décision tout de suite, je ne suis pas confortable. Il savait, vous, vous le saviez. Il s'est déjà fait prendre deux fois à déroger aux règles d'éthique. Malgré tout, vous procédez en sachant que oui, euh, a, envoyé des, euh, a engagé et payé la mère, le frère du premier ministre, son épouse. M. Morneau et sa femme ont eu des cadeaux, d'autres peut-être en ont eu. Et, et la dernière fois, M. Trudeau avait dit on se ferait, je ne me ferai plus jamais prendre la main dans le sac. Et quel mécanisme avez-vous mis en place pour vous retrouver encore aujourd'hui avec la même problématique? On dirait qu'il n'y a, a personne qui n'a rien appris de, des aventures précédentes. Ms. Telford. So there's a, there's a lot in there. Um, I, uh, I'll start with the, um, the fact of what we, what we knew at that time and when we were making the decision. And what I knew at that time, and, uh, and the Prime Minister has spoken to, is the fact that the Prime Minister has gone on the stage for some We Day events. Um, he was never paid for speaking at those events. Uh, they, were, uh, some, they were youth empowerment events that he'd gone to as someone passionate uh, about empowering youth, but also as the youth critic and later the youth minister in the first mandate. Um, and I also knew that the ethics commissioner, as I said in my opening remarks, that the ethics commissioner we had we had sought advice from as it related to Sophie Grégoire Trudeau's role with the WE Charity Organization and received clearance that she could both take that role on and have her expenses covered by the organization. We will have to go back to Mr. Fortin. Madame uh, Telford. En tant que conseillère du premier ministre, vous êtes sa chef de cabinet. Lui, avez-vous déjà dit à M. Trudeau qu'il il ne devrait pas s'impliquer dans cette décision-là? As I said, as I said what we discussed at the time and what we knew at the time was um, that this was, this was a binary choice, as one of the other members said earlier. It was a choice on whether to proceed with this program to support students this summer in this, in this way of connecting them to their communities or not. And the Prime Minister, there was no conflict uh, discussed at that time. Votre recommandation à, à vous, c'était quoi auprès de M. Trudeau? Lui recommandiez-vous de procéder malgré le conflit d'intérêts ou l'apparence, disons, de conflit d'intérêts? So first of all, again, as I said in my opening remarks, and as the Prime Minister referred to, and I believe the Clerk of the Privy Council um, made reference to as well, I did have questions on May 8th and had some concerns. I had concerns um, in terms of ensuring that the, um, the, the, the uh, that this was the right organization uh, in order to do this, that it was truly the only organization that could do this, that all of the T's had been crossed and I's had been dotted, 
And yes, as I said in my opening remarks, I had some concerns around perception, knowing that it had just been recently that Sophie Grégoire Trudeau's uh, podcast had been launched. Uh, but I also knew that the Ethics Commissioner had cleared that. And we, so on that basis, we decided to proceed. We'll and let I it go back. the Prime Minister in that. We'll let it go back to Mr. Fortin. The last uh, question, uh, Mr. Oui. Fortin. Vous êtes en train de nous dire, Mme Telford, que le commissaire à l'éthique vous a dit que M. Trudeau pouvait procéder de la sorte, qu'il pouvait confier ce contrat-là à oui, participer aux décisions, malgré les apparences de conflit d'intérêts. C'est ça, votre témoignage? Ms. Telford. What I said was, and I said also in my opening remarks, is that we had clearance from the Ethics Commissioner for Sophie Grégoire Trudeau to um, have the uh, to do the work that she was doing question. with the WE organization. Uh, Mr. Fortin, we're out of uh, time on that round. Uh, ouais. Monsieur le Président, question de privilège. J'ai un problème, Monsieur le Président, le point d'ordre. Moi, là, parce que je questionne point des témoins... Point yes, go. Oui. Go, go. Parce que je questionne les témoins en français, je perds peut-être pas la moitié, mais je perds environ 20 à 30 de mon temps à cause du délai de, de, de traduction. Et là, j'ai des réponses qui ne sont pas en rapport avec mes questions et je ne peux pas intervenir auprès du témoin qui, de toute façon, manifestement, ne comprend pas ce que je dis. Et même les traductions sont tellement pauvres que vous êtes obligé vous-même, Monsieur le Président, et en tout respect, vous faites de bonnes traductions, je pense, mais vous êtes obligé de traduire au témoin les questions que je pose. Imaginez-vous le temps qui me reste, moi, comparativement aux gens des autres partis, alors que déjà, on a beaucoup beaucoup moins de temps que les conservateurs et les libéraux. En passant, les libéraux, c'est des pauses publicitaires. C'est demander aux témoins de se vanter puis de dire qu'il est bon puis qu'il est fin. Alors moi, j'aimerais ça avoir un temps de parole qui soit équivalent et, à celui des conservateurs et que je puisse faire mon travail correctement, Monsieur le Président. Merci, uh, Thank you, Mr. Fortin, and I and I actually do believe you have a a, a legitimate concern. I am always, uh, when you're asking questions, I am having a hard job keeping up because I have to wait for translation too. We'll have to deal with that at a at a committee level uh, sometime. But I think it is a it is a concern. Uh, Mr. Julian, uh, six minute round. Who will be followed by Mr. Cooper? Mr. Julian. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Tel Telford, for uh, for being here today. Uh, we appreciate uh, you being available for the full uh, full two hours. Uh, you mentioned uh, I'll have a couple quick quick questions to start. You mentioned earlier fully cooperating with the Ethics Commissioner. Now, well, we'll recall, of course, um, the previous scandal, the SNC Lavalin scandal. The Ethics Commissioner said 11 months ago that he was quote unable to fully discharge the investigatory duties conferred upon me. Uh, because he wasn't getting the documentation from the PMO and the PCO. Um, can you state that um, you're willing to cooperate both with the Ethics Commissioner and also uh, with this committee and provide uh, all the documentation, including the recommendations that went forward on May 8th and May 22nd, all documentation concerning uh, the WE program? Ms. Telford. I'm, of course, uh, and I've always been happy to coordinate with the Ethics Commissioner, to coordinate, to cooperate and coordinate, um, but to cooperate with the Ethics Commissioner and will continue to do so. Uh, and in terms of documents, I, uh, I would have to look into, I'm not sure what documents you're looking for, but I'm happy to look into uh, any specific requests. That, the specific request is for the memos that went, were going to cabinet on May 8th and went to cabinet on May May 22nd. Those are very specific requests, and the the PCO has already indicated that they will be providing that to us, and we would appreciate having the cooperation of the PMO. A uh, second quick question. Uh, we know that you've had a past background uh, with both WE and its predecessor organization. Have you or any member of your family, either directly or indirectly through Artbound, ever received expense reimbursement, free travel, uh, financial payments, uh, use of WE uh, staff time? No. Uh, thank you. Now, my third question is uh, around uh, Mr. Morneau's uh, deep uh, connections with WE. Were you aware of Mr. Morneau's uh, connections and his family connections with the WE organizations? Uh, the only connection uh, that I was uh, that, that only really came back to me recently was uh, the fact that, as the Prime Minister mentioned, his daughter uh, had written a book um, that when I saw the cover shown recently, it had, uh, or I'm not sure if it was the front or the back, but um, 
it did have a quote from a Kilberger on it, and that was really the extent of my knowledge of the connection. Were, were you aware of the private travel that was not reimbursed the use of private aircraft? Were you aware of any of those cases with Mr. Morneau? Not until recently. Uh, were you aware that we uh, use their staff on staff time and, and re basically provide them with expense reimbursements to help fill seats and uh, act as backdrops at, at Mr. Morneau's events? No. Uh, given those direct benefits, uh, would you agree that Mr. Morneau was clearly in a conflict of uh, interest around this, this WE proposal? Minister Morneau has already uh, said that he, uh, he, he apologized and said that he wished he'd recused himself uh, from this cabinet decision, and I obviously support that. Uh, so if you believe he was in a conflict of interest, uh, would that not apply to Mr. Trudeau as well? The Prime Minister also said, and it was out of concern for perception, uh, he's also recently said that uh, he wished he'd recused himself from this, and I support that as well. But you, you would agree that they were both in a conflict of interest, in other words, had contravened the Conflict of Interest Act? No, I think that is... <laughs> No, what both of them said is that, uh, and what the Prime Minister said specifically, um, is that he wished he'd recused himself from this, from this particular decision at Cabinet uh, so that there weren't any concerns around perception of favoritism. So, so you see it as a perception, not as a violation of the Conflict of Interest Act. Okay, thank you for that. Now, uh, moving on to the actual decision, were you involved or was the Prime Minister's office involved in any way in the decision not to adequately fund Canada's summer jobs program for students, as you uh, are aware, and as MPs across the country are aware, uh, it was uh, basically a program that was shortchanged and right across the country, uh, positions uh, were not filled uh, because of the, the inadequate funding that was provided to Canada's summer jobs. Was that a decision that you were aware of or that you took part of? I, I do believe that differs uh, from uh, uh, from uh, the issue we're discussing today, uh, uh, Peter. But I will uh, go ahead, Ms. Telford, if you would it's answer. It's very relevant, ahead. Mr. Chair. Very relevant. I know how important uh, the Canada Summer Jobs Program is both to students and to uh, all of the honourable members in uh, the House of Commons. We uh, we hear about it from caucus members on a regular basis. How important it is. Um, in their writings, and uh, I was pleased to hear recently that uh, there's over $85,000 uh, 85, jobs that have been approved through the Canada Summer Jobs Program this summer. Well, well my, my question was actually, were you involved in that decision or who took that decision? Uh, but I'll move on. Um, I will quote from you uh, from the Public Service Alliance of Canada's National President, Chris Alward, who appeared before this committee. He said, and I quote, uh, Mr. Trudeau's claim that We Charity is the only one that can administer the new grant program is not only factually wrong, it's also insulting to our members. And that means both in terms of the Prime Minister's testimony and yours, that factually uh, you are giving uh, information that is simply incorrect. To what extent was the public service actually involved in this decision when clearly public servants wanted to be involved in the program, were ready to be involved in the program, and don't appear to have been considered at any point in the elaboration of this scheme? So uh, we can go based on the information uh, that was recommended to us at the time by public servants. And public servants themselves said that this was a program at this time that was best administered by a third party organization. I just quoted a hey, public servant that said the contrary. Mr. Uh, Mr. Julian, uh, I took a little time from your talk in there, so I'll give you one more question. Uh, the, the public servants have indicated that they could administer the new grant program. My question to you is, uh, and it comes back to the Canada Summer Jobs Underfunding as well, who made these decisions? Were they passed on to you? Uh, were you aware in the Prime Minister's office or did the Prime Minister's office uh, participate in these decisions that had such wide reaching consequences? Look, it's my job to give the best advice I can based on the best information I can to the Prime Minister on all of the decisions that are coming before him and before the cabinet. Uh, so to the extent that any of the various student and youth programs 
were coming to cabinet, um, then I was giving advice to the prime minister on those programs. Okay, uh, thank you uh, both. Uh, we'll now go to a five minute round. Uh, first up will be Mr. Cooper, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Cumming and Ms. Katrakis. Mr. Cooper, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you very much, Ms. Telford, for being here today. Uh, you said, and uh, the Prime Minister said, that the Ethics Commissioner gave a clearance with respect to the activities of uh, Ms. Gregoire Trudeau uh, with respect to we. And the Prime Minister said that clearance had taken place uh, a long time ago. Would you not see that there might be a need to talk to the Ethics Commissioner on May 8th? Uh, in the face of a half a billion dollar contribution uh, that the Prime Minister would be involved in discussing and ultimately deciding at the Cabinet table. Ms. Telford. So when, um, when clearance was sought for um, the work that Sophie Gregoire Trudeau has been doing uh, to work on destigmatizing mental health and empowering young people, the uh, ethics commissioner actually explicitly stated that she was asked to be she was asked to be doing this in her own right, not as wife of the prime minister, and that her expenses could be covered as part of that work. Uh, and um, so, but, so we had the clearance for her to do the thing she was doing, Ms. and it actually also explicitly stated that it did not put us into any position of conflict. Ms. Telford, that was in the abstract. Now you had before you a half a billion dollar contribution that was being discussed and decided upon at cabinet. Did you advise the prime minister that he ought to consult the ethics commissioner? And if not, why not? And why didn't he? Because obviously it's proven as it turns out to be of some interest to the ethics commissioner. Ms. Telford. I don't believe it was entirely in the abstract. Uh, we had a very uh, complete description of what Sophie's work was going to be and the kind of, um, uh, and, and the scope of it. And that's what had actually just recently launched. The podcast was part of that scope. It also included a clearance for her to be able to do travel uh, for some of her speaking engagements with the organization. You, you said, and the prime minister said, you were concerned about people's perceptions. I submit that I take it that would be perceptions of conflict of interest. I would submit actual conflicts of interest. So it's inexplicable why you or would not have advised him or why he would not have taken it upon himself to go to uh, the ethics commissioner. But I want to uh, ask you uh, about May 8th uh, and uh, what you said and what he said, namely that uh, he pushed back uh, when he learned about uh, the proposal and had questions. If, in fact, the Prime Minister pushed back, then how do you explain that the WE organization was collecting eligible expenses as of May 5th? Ms. Tilford. Um, I think that is a question that is, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you did, but it's a question best placed to the officials who made the arrangements with the WE organization. I believe you asked those questions of the WE organization as well in terms of the specifics within the uh, within the contribution agreement. Um, but you suggested that it was perhaps, you said if he pushed back, I can assure you, uh, he actually did push back with a number of questions in that briefing and it's why it didn't go to cabinet that day. Well, but for two weeks uh, between May 8th and May 22nd, we continued to incur eligible uh, expenses. So uh, it just doesn't add up to say the prime minister pushed back uh, but it, it wasn't frozen. The message wasn't conveyed to we, and they continued to proceed with uh, moving ahead as though they were about to administer the program. How do you explain that? Again, I would encourage you to ask those questions if you haven't already, though I'm sure you did, of the um, of the uh, the we organization and of the officials involved in uh, the crafting of the contribution. Well, agreement. well, clearly the message didn't get very far if the prime minister, in fact, pushed back. The program was launched, as you as you know, at the um, at the end of June, and um, and it was only at that time uh, that the agreement, or or just prior to then, obviously, that the agreement was finalized. How they structured the details within the agreement, that I cannot speak to. 
well, they continue to incur expenses as the prime minister supposedly pushed back. But I want to ask you, uh, Mr. Julian had raised the issue of Artbound, and I want to uh, pick up a little bit on that and ask more broadly, what is the total value of expenses, benefits, reimbursements, or any other in-kind or monetary consideration that you have received from the WE organization or any organization affiliated with Kiel Burgers? Nothing. And uh, that would include with respect to your travel with Craig and Mark Kielberger to Kenya in February of 2011? I did not travel anywhere. Uh, you did not travel anywhere in February of 2011? Well, I happened to have pulled up an article uh, uh, profiling Jason Denny, in which it notes that uh, in February of 2011, uh, that he, along with Seamus O'Regan, Craig and Mark Kielberger, uh, Amanda Alvero and Katie Telford, among many ex uh, extraordinary efforts, traveled to a region of Kenya to build an art school. Do you know nothing about that trip? I'm familiar with how they went on that trip. I was not okay. on that trip. Okay. Okay, uh, we'll have to end it there, Mr. Uh, Cooper, and we'll go to Mr. Fraser, followed by Mr. Cumming. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Telford, for being with us today. I want to just uh, uh, prod into the May 8th meeting uh, a little bit uh, where there was uh, pushback and concerns raised. In response to uh, Mr. Barrett's question earlier, you indicated the kinds of things that were pushed back on was the uh, the binary choice that was presented by the public service. Uh, I'm curious, did they? you actually push back, you or the Prime Minister pushed back on, on the idea that it had to be a binary choice? Did you ask that they consider other organizations? Yes, those were the types of questions we were um, we were interested in, um, and uh, and as the committee has has heard, I believe from some uh, of the the preceding witnesses that they um, they had considered and assessed a number of other partners, but that was the kind of thing exactly that we wanted to know. And nevertheless, they remained confident that the choice was binary: we go ahead with We Charity, or the program doesn't happen. Is that fair? That's right. Okay. Uh, did you or anybody else uh, at PMO ever ask uh, We Charity to administer the Canada Student Service Grant Program? No. Um, there was a uh, evidence tendered in uh, before this committee previously. There was some other unsolicited proposal for a youth entrepreneurship strategy. Did you or anybody at PMO ever have conversations with the Kielbergers or others at We Charity uh, about that program? I don't believe so. Um, did you, uh, did, did, frankly, did you ever speak with the Kielbergers personally since, I don't know, we'll pick a date back around the beginning of the, say the first of March before the pandemic began? Um, I'm pretty sure, cause I have been racking my brain on this. I'm pretty sure the last time I saw Mark Kielberger was at an event of hundreds of people in Toronto, uh, where I, I met his wife and exchanged pleasantries. It was a Toronto life event or something of that kind in uh, December of 2017. Uh, did you or anybody else in the Prime Minister's office have any role in actually negotiating the contribution agreement? No. So all of the details around which entity was being paid would have been done through the public service, not through uh, political office? Yes, there were, in terms of which, uh, yes, on the specific, I would just say more broadly that policy staff between different offices uh, were ensuring certain objectives were being met through the contribution agreement, but the negotiation absolutely was not happening through uh, through political staff at all. Thank you, and I appreciate that clarification as well. Um, I'm curious, as, as a local MP, I, I, um, I get unsolicited proposals uh, all the time for projects, usually in my own riding. Uh, is this something that you find comes up with perhaps uh, organizations that are, are bigger than the ones in my backyard uh, that actually pitch unsolicited proposals to the Prime Minister's office for policy ideas or programs? That that does happen. It did not. Uh, it did not happen in this case that I received any unsolicited proposal directly. Um, but uh, that absolutely does happen from all kinds of organizations. Staff in the Prime Minister's office. It's it's something I encourage is for them to be talking to stakeholders and staying connected to the ground, talking to MPs, talking to MPs of all parties when they have something that they want to pitch that uh, they believe that the government should be doing that allows us to serve Canadians better. 
And in, in fact, I think there was the reason I ask is there was sort of a, an in, innuendo through the course of this uh, this committee hearing that it was somehow inappropriate that uh, an organization would have had uh, an inside track to make unsolicited proposals. Um, but but in fact, I agree with you. I think it's actually a positive thing. In fact, uh, the, those kinds of pitches have uh, uh, led to projects going ahead in my own community from nonprofits uh, r routinely, frankly, uh, that don't know the best way to turn. And uh, I'm curious, have you actually seen any positive programs implemented as a result of those kinds of unsolicited proposals? I, I hate to put you on the spot. I, if, if there's not one front of mine, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you uh, skate on this one. Um, I'm, I'm sure there have been. Uh, I can think of a number of examples of, um, of, of women's organizations and uh, who have contacted me over time in particular, who uh, felt they had an open door with me to, uh, to try to see if they could um, uh, have more of a role working with the federal government to promote women in all kinds of different sectors. I can't think of a specific example off the top of my head, but I, there certainly have been some. Um, sure. One of the things that I'm, I'm curious about, I, I was a little bit involved through um, uh, the finance team's efforts to uh, take feedback from stakeholders all across Canada on some of the emergency measures that our government's put forward in response to, uh, to COVID-19. Uh, frankly, the, the Canada Student Service Grant is not something that uh, I was engaged with consultation processes on. Uh, but from your perspective, uh, how much time did this eat up in comparison to the other programs? I'm thinking about CERB, the wage subsidy, the uh, rental assistance, the program to support women's programs, uh, programs to support charities, et cetera. I don't want to just rhyme off a list of dozens of programs here. Uh, but what was the time breakdown? Was this a, a major time suck in terms of the policy development, or, or how does it compare to the other programs? That allowed to be the last question, Sean, uh, Ms. Uh, Telford. Um, well, I can't. I can't speak for for everyone involved in this because I'm sure it took uh, a lot of work by a, a lot of the both policy staff in different offices and, uh, of course, the officials who worked on this program. Uh, though I do know that many of those same people were working on more than one uh, program and issue to support Canadians uh, at 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 a time. And uh, as you've heard, in terms of the prime minister, uh, you know, I think probably in um, in normal circumstances, uh, there would have been some greater lengths of time even just between cabinet committee and committee and uh, briefings from one to the next. And that is what has made this time so unprecedented is that things are moving from, you know, one, as, as I said on the Canada wage subsidy, there were 15 decision points on April 5th for a wage subsidy that was, I think desperately needed by Canadians and Canadian businesses, and it was being announced the next day. That's how quickly things have been moving. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, you uh, both. Uh, turning to uh, Mr. Uh, Cumming, followed by Ms. Kotrakis. Uh, we have uh, five minutes, uh, James. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Telford, for uh, being here today. Uh, on which date since March 1st did you communicate with Minister Morneau or his staff about WE? Um, I don't know if you mean ahead of, um, ahead of the cabinet meeting, I don't believe on any dates. And you'd, you'd uh, mentioned, you had suggested before that you're aware of the Morneau's uh, connection with the daughter with the book, uh, but you, I just want to clarify, you were unaware of any travel that uh, Minister Morneau might've taken or the family uh, travel? That's right. But given what we know now with the Morneau's direct involvement in this project and his failure to recuse himself and, and this illegally sponsored paid travel uh, from the organization in question, do you think the minister should step down? I think some of the things you're saying have not been determined um, at all. And I don't believe, I believe the, the minister of finance has already said that he wished he had recused himself. He's apologized for that. And uh, does not believe there is a conflict beyond that, but that is for the conflict commissioner to spend time on, and everyone has agreed to cooperate fully. Uh, when did you become aware of WE's April 9th proposal? April 9th proposal. So this is the Canada Summer Student Grant proposal. Oh, that, no, right? that was their initial proposal about uh, social, social entrepreneurship. Right. Um, so it was in a very large uh, briefing package that we received on April 20th ahead of an April 21st briefing. 
it was uh, actually Annex 9 of, uh, of that package uh, when I looked back to, to get some of these things straight for all of you. Um, and actually, that, that, um, that annex ultimately was never followed through on and was turned down in terms of that proposal. And what was contained in that large uh, briefing package? What were the specifics that were in it? It was so large because that was the package that led to the $9 billion announcement by this government to support students. So that included everything that was in that. It was, and, and that was again, being briefed on the 20th for an announcement that was coming uh, within, uh, within hours, let alone days. So related to that April 9th proposal, did anyone in the PMO communicate with ministers Morneau, Chagger or Ng about that proposal? I'm sure that policy staff, um, as they do on, on every issue uh, that is coming up within the government, we're talking to each other between minister's offices. Can you provide uh, the staff members that were communicating regarding that proposal? Can I provide? I'm here on their behalf, so I'm happy to take a question on it if you'd like. So you, you wouldn't know how, what level of communication there was uh, regarding that proposal between those ministers' offices? Was it one person? Was it, was it uh, lots of chatter? Or you know, what, what was the extent of the discussions with the other ministers' offices? Look, that was a proposal that ultimately is uh, not one that this government proceeded with uh, and, that, uh, and that the prime minister's office did not, did not approve. Um, so there was obviously analysis done to that extent. And there would have been conversations between the different ministers' office to come to that determination. The issue there, though, is that they submitted a proposal, and then, lo and behold, we submit another proposal. So, was there any instructions back to those departments or to we to come back with a modified proposal? The way in which the first proposal came through uh, in terms of a briefing note that I saw, it was actually recommending uh, from our policy team to not proceed with that proposal. That was the, the, the total sum of the advice on that proposal was that we not proceed on it. The last so, question, uh, Mr. Cumming. So when was the first time that you communicated with uh, Minister Ng about we or the Kilbergers since March 1st? I don't believe we have communicated uh, about we or the Kilbergers in that time period at all. Okay, you got time for one more, James. That was a quick question, a quick answer. Go ahead. So you you don't you don't believe or you don't know whether you or your staff or anyone in the department had any kind of discussions with Mary Ng about uh, we uh, since March. Oh, I thought your previous question was about me. Um, so I personally did not have a conversation with Minister Ng about that proposal. Um, I, I would have to, um, I am unaware of staff having spoken directly to her, though I suspect they did speak, as I already said, that they would have been speaking with her office on that proposal. Okay, uh, thank you uh, both. Uh, we'll now turn to uh, Ms. Kutrakis and then on to uh, Ms. Goodrow and Ms. Uh, Mr. Julian. Uh, Ms. Kutrakis. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Merci, merci uh, Katie, uh, Madame Telford, d'être ici avec nous cet après-midi. Uh, Uni ou We Charity a envoyé la proposition d'entrepreneuriat social au gouvernement en avril 2020. Étiez-vous au courant de cette proposition à l'époque? So, are we talking, I just want to make sure I'm talking about the right, are we talking about the social entrepreneurial proposal? Exactement. Okay. Um, merci. Um, so, uh, I, was, I was not aware when it first when it first came into the Prime Minister's office. As I said, there was advice that came through uh, from our policy team. And, and just you know, to provide a little more on that, uh, the reason that, you know, one of the reasons in terms of not proceeding with that proposal was actually, it seemed like it might be a better program fit uh, from a recovery standpoint, perhaps, um, but it wasn't the right thing at this time. Right now we are focused on emergency measures to, and we needed emergency measures to support students and uh, that was the phase we were in from April, uh, well, and, and we continue to be in. 
Et compte tenu de l'importance et la portée de la Bourse canadienne et services aux étudiants et de la rapidité avec laquelle le programme a été élaboré et mis en œuvre, le premier ministre et le ministre des Finances auraient-ils pu se retirer complètement du processus décisionnel? Il y, y aura-t-il un impact significatif excuse-moi, sur l'entroi en temps voulu ou sur la qualité de la Bourse canadienne de services aux étudiants si le premier ministre euh, se récusait complètement de la décision? So both the, both the prime minister and the minister of finance have said that they, uh, they wish that they had recused themselves. Um, it's, uh, it's hard to speak in terms of what, what might be the case, uh, but I, I don't believe because the, the program was being offered as a binary choice, it was whether to proceed or not proceed, that the program would have been any different if they had been there. But there was, I think in, in retrospect, they have both said, given the potential um, for concern around a perception, um, a perception of favoritism, uh, that that was reason alone for them to have recused themselves. And can you please describe how a program of similar size and scope as the CSSG would be designed, outsourced and administered under normal circumstances? Can you compare that process to the process used to determine how this program would be outsourced and implemented given the current uh, crisis situation we are facing? So um, I'm not sure uh, that it would be in a, uh, any different if we were in a, uh, in a non-crisis time uh, or a non-pandemic crisis time, um, except for you know, one very big factor, which is obviously that things were moving very, very quickly uh, and the volume of work that was being done. We had people uh, working from their homes, uh, obviously, and um, everyone was, was separate from each other and uh, having to work right around the clock. I mean, it was 15 to 20 hour days, seven days a week. So those were some not insignificant differences uh, that don't explain anything other than to say, I think those, those were the, the true differences uh, between uh, now and perhaps a normal time. I would also just add that there have been both during this time and in the past, but several examples during this time as well where, and I believe the prime minister may have, may have referenced these, at least one of them, that, that there have been many other examples of using third party organizations, working and partnering with third party organizations uh, to be able to help deliver programs during this time. And my final question, Mr. Chair, if I may, um, can you expand, Ms. Telford, uh, on the lessons learned throughout this process and comment on how these lessons will be applied going forward to avoid similar confusions or perceptions of conflict of interest? What more can we put in place um, in, in you know, all cabinet members and especially for the PM? So I think, um... I think, as I said in, in one, of my, uh, one of my earlier answers, uh, a, a reflection that we've had is uh, knowing that this crisis is ongoing, is how even within a crisis we ensure that we are adding, um, adding layers of protection, adding uh, rigor to the process, uh, and not, um, not even, even if it means slowing down slightly, uh, despite the fact that we still need to move very, very quickly to support Canadians and need to continue doing that. Um, and finding that right balance, this has obviously given us a pause to make sure that, uh, that we keep improving. Okay, uh, thank you both. Uh, Ms. Goudreau, uh, we're down to uh, a two and a half minute oui, round bonjour, or three. Go ahead. J'ai omis, là j'espère que le temps compte pas, j'ai omis de vous dire que pour le reste de cette séance, je cède la parole à mon collègue, M. Fortin. Okay, well. I'll not take that. I'll not take that time from ideas, Mr. Fortin. You're on. My apologies. Merci, c'est gentil, M. le Président. M. le Président, je vais commencer d'abord en m'excusant pour tantôt. Je crois que j'ai, M. Mal, je disais que le service de traduction me causait un préjudice énorme puisque je perds environ 20 de mon temps, mais la critique n'était pas à l'endroit des traducteurs eux-mêmes. Je tiens à le préciser, ils font un travail exceptionnel. Ceci dit, Mme Telford, vous nous dites que si c'était à refaire, vous, vous croyez qu'il y, y aurait lieu d'améliorer les mécanismes de protection pour qu'une situation comme ça ne se reproduise pas. C'est étonnant quand on sait que c'est la 
troisième fois que le premier ministre se fait prendre et qu'il y a eu un problème semblable avec Taga Khan au début. Euh, comment se fait-il que ces, ces mécanismes-là n'ont pas déjà été améliorés depuis les, les, les événements de Taga Khan? As I said in my opening remarks, and I think I've said in a couple of answers already, I think we always need to be working uh, to improve and to find different ways uh, to make sure that we are um, being as, as, uh, as careful and cognizant as possible even of just the perception of any favoritism or, or conflict or anything else. And uh, I think, We've been reflecting on that and we are going to keep working hard to improve and we will be working with the ethics commissioner and taking any advice that they have as well. On est d'accord avec ça, c'est certain, Mme Telford. Ce que je ne comprends pas, c'est comment ça se fait que ce n'est pas déjà fait. Mais bon, ceci dit, M. Trudeau et M. Morneau se sont tous deux excusés de ne pas s'être récusés au moment de la décision. Ils disent regretter de ne pas l'avoir fait. Euh, quel est votre avis à vous? Êtes-vous d'accord avec eux qu'ils auraient dû se récuser à ce moment-là? Of course, I supported uh, both of them in terms of their, their statements to Canadians. Donc, vous êtes d'accord avec le fait qu'ils auraient dû ne pas participer aux décisions octroyant ce mandat-là à We Charity. Vous êtes d'accord? I think they've both said that in hindsight um, and, and upon reflection that they both wish that they had recused themselves. Oui, that I vous... agree with. Mais, mais la question, c'est vous. Est-ce que vous êtes d'accord avec ça, qu'ils n'auraient pas dû siéger sur ce, cette décision-là? I think I'm answering your question, uh, sir. It's, I, I support both the minister and the prime minister in what they said. Um, OK. OK. A Et, last uh, question, uh, Mr. Fortin. Et Madame Telford, si vous êtes d'accord aujourd'hui pour dire qu'il n'aurait pas dû siéger et que les deux sont d'accord aujourd'hui pour dire qu'il n'aurait pas dû siéger là-dessus, comment expliquez-vous qu'entre le 8 mai, le moment où le, le drapeau se lève, à mon, ami, à mon avis, il aurait dû se lever avant, mais il se lève le 8 mai, comment expliquez-vous qu'entre le 8 mai et le moment de prendre la décision, vous décidez tous ensemble de dire « OK, on va voter », puis aujourd'hui, vous dites tous ensemble « Ah non, on n'aurait pas dû finalement ». Comment expliquez-vous ce changement-là I think at the time, and I would just take you back to what we uh, what we talked about in terms of what we were aware of at the time. Um, the prime minister has, you know, actually when he became leader of the Liberal Party, he disclosed all of his financials and proactively disclosed all of his previous paid speaking engagements in a way that I'm not sure that any political leaders have done in the past. And um, it's something we'd been very, very transparent about. I knew that he'd never been uh, been paid to speak for any we day or we functions. Um, I similarly knew that all of uh, Sophie Grégoire Trudeau's work um, and since the prime minister, uh, since we were in government, that none of that had ever been paid and that we actually had clearance from the ethics commissioner for the role that she had taken on. And so there wasn't discussion of conflict at that time. Okay, uh, then we'll, <clears throat> we'll go on to uh, <clears throat> Mr. Julian, two and a half, three minutes, uh, <clears throat> Peter, and following, uh, Uh, Mr. Julian will be uh, Mr. Uh, Morant. Uh, Mr. Julian. Oh, thank you. I am interested in going into the due diligence that uh, Mr. Trudeau alluded to in his testimony between May 8th and May 22nd. We've already determined that the public service was perfectly willing and able to assume the program. So there's no longer this uh, a binary choice uh, that seems to have been part of uh, testimony to justify it. But I'm interested in uh, the issue of uh, liability. Um, during that two-week period, was there investigation and were you aware that the contract would actually be signed with the We Charity Foundation, which is a basically a shell foundation with no assets? And that would increase liability uh, challenges, of course, for the students if they were involved with the program, but also to the federal government. Were you aware of that? And what due diligence was done around that? Um, I was not aware of the uh, We Charity, We Foundation uh, distinction at the time. That would be Thank something that would be left to uh, and, and is wise, I believe, for uh, for political staff to be leaving to the public servants is to sort out 
the details of how a contract uh, and how a contribution agreement should flow. Okay, so there's no discussion of that. Um, the code of ethics uh, governs teachers and I'll mention BCTF, of course, as you know, the prime minister uh, was briefly a teacher uh, two sections of the Code of Ethics include uh, number two, the member uh, teacher must respect the confidential nature of information concerning students and may give it only to authorized persons or agencies directly concerned with their welfare. And section three, that a privileged relationship exists between teachers and students. And in other words, uh, the teacher must refrain from exploiting that relationship for material advantage. Now, of course, in the WE scheme, there was a $12,000 payment to teachers uh, that uh, I think quite clearly violates uh, those two components of the code of ethics uh, for British Columbia and would right across the country. To what extent was due diligence performed to ensure that the scheme itself actually met codes of ethics for teachers across the country who of course uh, maintain the highest possible standards? I've actually, in my career, done a lot of work uh, with teachers' organizations and teachers' associations as well. And um, but I can't say I was not involved in uh, sorting out the, this part of the agreement. So, so Ms. Telford, very, very who, quick, who, uh, quickly, who Peter. was in the room? Who was making these decisions for this proposal? Who was in the room? Are you aware of the people? that made this decision because uh, the public service obviously uh, says that they could have done it. Uh, all of this mess has, has blossomed forward and no one seems to be wanting to take responsibility for it. Who was in the room? I think you've actually spoken to quite a number of the people who are in the room, Mr. Julian. I think you've spoken to some of the senior most officials and you've spoken to the Minister of Diversity, Inclusion and Youth. Uh, and um, so I'm, I'm not sure how you're confused on that. What, I'm not confused. I'd just like to know, uh, are you aware of who was in the room developing the scheme? And can you provide those names to us? Ms. Telford? I, 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 would, ha I would have to, uh, to look into that with the clerk of the Privy Council, but I believe that you've actually already spoken to all of the key people um, who would actually be able to answer that exact question for you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, thank you all. And uh, now we'll turn to, I have Mr. Morantz on my list to Polyev. see next to Mr. Polyev. Oh. Okay, Mr. Polyev will be uh, followed by Mr. Uh, McLeod. Uh, you have five minutes, uh, Mr. Polyev. The WE Charity says that it had a th authorization to begin implementing the program on May 5th. Did anyone in the PMO speak to the organization on May 5th? Yes or no? Yes, I already stated that. Who? I'm here on behalf of my staff Who? and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have for them. Is Who? there a question you have for them? Yes, uh, I'd like to know the name. What is your name, sir or madam, whoever it is? Um, so you don't have a question for them. You just yes, would like I do. your name? Please. It was our director of policy, Rick Tice, a very long time, hard working political staffer in this town. Rick Tice, okay. And did it ever did, uh, was that the only conversation the PMO had with the WE Charity or its associated groups? No, as I previously stated, um, there were a handful in, How many? in total. Well, a handful usually suggests around five. I don't have an exact number. There and were a were, few interactions around which the time staff members did that, did, of the announcement. Which staff we, we, member? I give uh, give Ms. Telford time to uh, answer uh, Mr. Polyev, uh, Ms. Telford. There was some back and forth that is perfectly normal and actually expected right. around the time of the names. launch of the program. Okay, so we'll get the we want the we want their names and uh, we expect P that you you will submit their names. Will you give us the names? Yes or no? I can get back to you. Yes or no? Will you give? I the can names? look into that. Okay, so you're obviously trying to cover up who they are and their identities. No, so we're I'm on to something to here. Answer whatever so I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, you I might have the floor now. I have a question right now. Is there anything uh, that might have happened in the conversation with Rick and we that would have that would have uh, alerted we that they could begin implementing the program on May fifth? Yes or no? No, I don't uh, believe so. And actually, as I already stated, so he actually redirected. The organization, which he had a very general discussion with them right. on, and he redirected them to ESDC. 
Okay, that's interesting because they claim that the ESDC is where we're told is the one that then told them they could start working on May 5th. Very strange because the prime minister claimed that the decision was not made in cabinet until May the 22nd. So if the PMO was not directing the work to begin, then who told we that they could start working on a project that didn't exist, would not go on to exist for at least another 12 or 13 days? Mr. Telford, you have about a half minute. So as one of your colleagues already asked me about this, and I will repeat my answer, which is that um, the uh, the program only launched at the end of June. And in terms of the details of how the program That's was uh, constructed in the- uh, Mr. Polyev, uh, give the witness time without interruption, she, and we give her equal time. Go ahead, Ms. Telford. The program was announced at the end of June. And in terms of the details around the contribution agreement, I would refer you back to, and I know you've already spoken to them, officials uh, from the department who were involved in that. Right, so your office spoke to we on May the 5th. And May the 5th is the day that we believed it could start spending money and implementing the program. Is that just a coincidence? Uh, Ms. Telford. The policy staff person in our office did what they do all the time, yes or which no. is take phone calls from stakeholders. He took a phone call from a stakeholder and redirected it yes to ESDC. No. It wasn't a stakeholder. It was a group that was implementing a taxpayer-funded program on behalf of your government, one that hadn't even been approved by cabinet. Uh, so Mr. You know, I asked you if it was a mere coincidence that we began implementing this program on the day that it spoke, the group spoke to Rick in your office, and you refused to answer that question. Ms. Telford, you will have about uh, 30 seconds to answer this, and then you're going to have to split 30 seconds between the two of you. The floor is yours, Ms. Telford. I can't speak to how the contribution agreement constructed the details around how they looked back at that time period. Um, because I do believe it was that. In terms of the conversation involving um, my office, it was a general discussion that was then redirected to ESDC. It actually was as simple as that. Well, it sounds Mr. like the oh, yeah. it sounds like the PMO directed the ESDC to give go ahead for the program to begin on that very day before cabinet that is even not uh, true. Yeah, cabinet even that approved is not true. before cabinet even approved the decision. This is the timeline you're expecting us to believe that the prime minister would not approve this in cabinet until May the 22nd, even though a month earlier, the department had told the charity that it had the, the, the go ahead, that it would receive the program. And two weeks earlier, before that cabinet decision, they would begin working on it. That timeline is not just hard to believe, it is chronologically impossible. Mr. Mr. Polyev, that'll end your, uh, your round. I will give... Uh... Uh, Ms. Telford, ample time to reply in detail if she likes. Uh, I would just add that on um, on May 5th, to add to the, uh, the things that happened on May 5th, that was um, the day that it also, that this proposal went to the COVID cabinet committee. And um, so it's possible officials were in touch with them in and around that. Um, but I can't, I can't speak to that. What I can speak to is what I know, which is it went to cabinet committee that day. Uh, it then came to cabinet on, uh, or it was going to go to cabinet on May 8th. And the it was then well. that we were first briefed on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, both. Uh, we'll go to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, McLeod uh, and who is up next from uh, the official opposition. You can give me a hand in a bit. Uh, Mr. Uh, I'll McLeod. be out, Mr. Chair, in the next Mr. round. Mr. Morantz, right. okay. Uh, Mr. McLeod, you have five minutes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for the presentation today and uh, for joining us to answer the many, many questions. Um, there is a, a lot of uh, work that's been happening on this issue. Uh, as I mentioned, mentioned to the Prime Minister, we've had now five meetings. Uh, on this uh, study. Um, I think there's probably gonna be two other committees if, if they're not already in place. 
uh, looking at this, uh, reviewing it and studying it. And all this is happening in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and after every session that we have, I always get a lot of calls and people asking me about uh, certain concerns they heard or certain issues that they don't understand or to explain things. So you, you mentioned a couple of times now, the COVID committee. Could you just maybe elaborate a little bit on what they do and what their responsibilities are? My first question. Yes, um, so I believe it would have been, I'm not entirely certain of this of the date, but I believe it would have been in early March. Um, might have been as uh, early as late February, but I believe it was early March that uh, the Prime Minister struck a cabinet committee, which we refer to as, as the COVID cabinet committee, um, and uh, that Minister, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland uh, chairs and the Treasury Board chair, Jean-Yves Duclos, vice chairs. And um, it has been a place to be able to move um, and take proposals to uh, that are in, involving the emergency measures and the restart. It's been a, you know, as, as we've all said, it is a, it's an incredible time. It's an unprecedented time. Things are moving extremely quickly. They've been meeting multiple times a week for months now and uh, for many hours a day at a time. And uh, they look at all of these emergency measures and apply a lens that, that the cabinet committees uh, pre-COVID would as well in other areas. Of course, there were cabinet committees on, um, on reconciliation and uh, on, on the economy yeah. and on global security. So, you know, we kind of consolidated things to deal with the emergency measures and restart to do with COVID to the COVID committee. And things would go to the COVID committee before then coming to a cabinet meeting, which have also been happening more frequently uh, than, uh, than even before COVID. It sounds like they're a very busy community. Could you they maybe are. give us an idea of how many other programs that have gone through the COVID committee and or cabinet uh, during this time period that this committee was formed? I, I know there's so many things on the go right now. Um, I am not sure of, of how many exactly. Um, so I, I don't want to guess at that, but it has been... Um, I mean, there have been, as we, as I mentioned, between the Canada Emergency Wage Benefit, the CERB, uh, the programs for seniors, uh, for vaccine development, uh, for uh, the manufacturing uh, sector and biomanufacturing. I mean, it, it has been an, an endless number of programs, and that's going to keep going for quite some time. They're doing, so, as you so say, through, a lot of work. Through all these programs that are being, you mentioned, and, and there's more that you didn't mention, but is the advice of the public service taken... Uh, on the implementation of all these different programs? Is there an input mechanism for input from public service? Absolutely. Um, everything that comes as a, uh, a memorandum to cabinet is something that is uh, that is crafted by the public service. So I, I wanted to ask one final question because it, it's very important to me. The, the, the opportunity to help the, some, uh, the students through a summer uh, volunteer program was brought to cabinet and the decision was either to make it happen or, or not do anything about it. And I'm, I'm glad that cabinet decided to go forward. Unfortunately, it, it, it kind of went off the rails. Now, the need that was identified when initially the cabinet was considering their, this is still there. Is there opportunity to revisit this issue, maybe rejig the terms, maybe have a different agency deliver it, uh, maybe change the time frame so that it goes into October even, uh, is, is there opportunity to do something like that? To, to kind of save uh, what's left of the summer and maybe into the fall and help the students because they, they still need the help. Um, they do. And fortunately, uh, this was one of many programs uh, that have been put in place to help young people. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this was, uh, which is not to diminish it at all, but it was, you know, less than one tenth of the package that was announced even just for the COVID period. And uh, as some of your colleagues on the committee had previously mentioned, um, there's the longstanding Canada Summer Jobs Program and other programs also in place to help youth. Having said that, in terms of this program specifically, I know that the Minister of Diversity, Inclusion and Youth is looking at all the options and, you um, well, uh, I, I hope that uh, something, as you're suggesting, can be figured out. 
Okay, with that, uh, we are a little over time. Uh, we'll go to uh, Mr. Morantz, uh, followed by Mr. Fregascadas. Uh, Marty, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Telford, I want to return to the question of the timeline that my colleague uh, was asking you about, Mr. Polyev. Uh, on April 22nd, the Prime Minister from his front steps announced the this program, the Canada Student Service Grant. Um, you, you testified you didn't learn about it until May 8th, and that, in fact, you didn't know we was being considered until May 8th. In fact, you say the PMO policy uh, people didn't speak to we until May 5th. When the PM, uh, when the Prime Minister announced this program on April 22nd, how, what, what did the PMO think, that, how did they think this program was going to be administered? Excuse me. Um, so just to clarify for you, on April 22nd, um, when he announced the $9 billion um, aid package for students and to support students through this time, you're right, he did announce as part of that the Canada Summer Student Grant, but it was... Um, it was There was, was no not, plan for having it administered, though. There was no... There were a lot of things during this period. It was important for us to be transparent with Canadians on what was coming. It was important for us to let okay. students know that this kind of program was coming. But, but uh, and you at said that yourself time, it was, uh, or the uh, Prime Mr. Minister Mr. did, Mr. Morant, that it was a binary Mr. choice. Morant, uh, How can he took, announce a program it, that he doesn't Mr. know is going to be administered? How Mr. it's going to be Morant, done? Mr. Morantz, it took I'm you I'm just asking a fair question, Mr. I Schreiber. know. You took about 50 seconds to ask the question. I will give Ms. Telford, okay. without interruption, the it same amount of time credibility, to answer. Though, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Ms. Telford. So at the time, and I believe the Prime Minister spoke to this um, in his uh, when he appeared before committee earlier, uh, he actually believed uh, that the option in terms of administering the program might be the Canada, Stu um, the Canada Service Corp. Uh, that he'd long been looking at and working on and was actually, you know, I think a bit disappointed much later when he learned that the only way it could be done um, was to go to a third party organization uh, for the so, purposes of this summer. So in other words, the Prime Minister announced a program, a $9 billion part, a dollar program, part of which is the Canada Summer Student Benefit, and really had nothing nailed down as to how it would be delivered. And, and, and in fact, on, on, on May 8th, it was advised it was a binary choice. It was we are nothing, and it ended up being nothing. It just stretches credulity. Let me ask you, in your long tenure uh, in politics and as the chief of staff, ha have you ever had this situation before where a program got announced and you had no idea the office you're responsible for how it's going to be administered? Ms. There's Talbert a lot of things um, that have uh, that have happened in the last number of months that I don't think any of us uh, on this, any of you on the committee or any of us in government have experienced before. And actually, yeah. something that I think has been really, really important that this government has been doing is letting Canadians know what's coming, what we're working on, and being extremely transparent, including saying it's not all going to be perfect and we're going to need to adjust yeah, as we go. Yeah, but this is different. This is announcing a, you know, a a billion dollar program without knowing how it's going to be administered. How can Canadians have any faith that you are respecting their taxpayers' dollars when you announce a program, the Prime, the prime Minister announces a program, he has no idea how it'll be administered. Anyway, um, you know- Would you like I, me to answer that? Yeah, well, I, I don't, sure, go ahead. Yes, I, I, uh, please, I, go ahead please, yeah. please do, Ms. Tilford, the floor is yours. I think Canadians can have faith in how this government is delivering because of what the, the supports that they're feeling, the fact that this government is being responsive, the Not fact students. that when the CERB and the wage subsidy weren't as, as simple and generous as maybe it needed students to be, we made down. sure to make those adjustments. And you know really what? Yes, for down. students That's as well. Mr. There was yeah. a $9 billion package yeah. announced for students. The majority, the large Without majority you know of which was going to be point of, point of order, Mr. Chair. Mr. Please, yes, uh, Mr. Fraser. You've made very clear on a number of occasions that the rules for this committee are under the same COVID rules that the uh, the uh, Parliament has been using. I shouldn't say Parliament, that the COVID committee has been using, where the questioner and the answer have equal time to give their answers and questions without interruption. I would ask that my honourable colleagues show just a modicum of respect 
to our witness and give her the time to answer the question because quite frankly, as a parliamentarian who's trying to pay attention to what's going on, I cannot hear the answer that is coming out and I would ask that you enforce the rules that you make I, clear were an application at the beginning of this meeting. Uh, thank you. I, I thank you. I, I will, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, and I Mr. apologize, President. but please, I, I ask that you not take my time away for that uh, interruption. We'll, we, won't, uh, we won't take the time away for, from you, uh, Mr. Morantz, but I will give uh, Ms. Telford uh, time to respond. Go ahead. Ms. I, actually, I believe that actually, you know, an adjustment that has happened um, that uh, we haven't seen by any governments in the past during COVID uh, that has been hugely beneficial to the relationship between a government and Canadians is just how transparent um, and forthcoming the government is and saying, here's what might be coming, here's what we're looking at, here's how we're going to adjust, here's when it's not right exactly. Um, I actually believe that's there are many, many reasons, in, and but especially in starting with the programs that got out the door so quickly, thanks to the very, very hard work of the public service in the early weeks of the COVID okay. shutdown. Okay, we will go back to Mr. Morantz, and this will be the uh, last okay. question. Uh, well, I, I uh, still Mr. have not heard an answer to the question. How the Prime Minister announces this program uh, without having any idea how it's going to be administered. That was an announcer, frankly, Mr. Chair. And I, I, maybe there isn't, maybe they don't have one because they knew, it seems to stretch credulity to that the prime minister did not know when he announced that how it was being administered. Did he know or not? How, how's okay. that? Did he know or not? Uh, and uh, Ms. Uh, Telford, do you have about 30 seconds to answer? The prime minister announced a $9 billion package to support students. And that particular element of that package um, was still to be determined. And he had a number of ideas at the time of how it might be administered, but in moving on to work on a number of other emergency measures while others worked it up, um, it then came back to him later that the only way to do this was with this binary choice that we've described to you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, that's, that's it, uh, Marty. Sorry for that. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to uh, Mr. Fred Escadas and uh, uh, then it will be Mr. Fortin for two and a half minutes, Mr. Julian. And if it's okay with the committee, I would allow Ms. May in for two uh, and on to an official opposition and uh, we'll probably wrap up with Mr. Sabera. Mr. Fregas got us. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Ms. Telford, thank you for being here and for the work that you've done these past few months. Uh, first of all, Mr. Chair, uh, it would have been good if Mr. Uh, Polyev had read the blues from the meeting that we had the other day. Uh, I have those blues in front of me. He was trying to connect dots that frankly do not exist. Let me quote from those blues. Um, Ms. Darowitz asked the question to Mark Kielberger uh, and she, uh, I'll quote her as follows. There is another thing that I'm a bit unclear about. I see the contribution in front of me. That's the contribution agreement, Mr. Chair. Uh, and it was signed on May 5th. Was it signed on May 5th or did the agreement begin on May 5th? If you could just explain the logistics around all of that. Mark Kielberger replied with the following. Thank you for asking. The agreement technically began on May 5th. We were working in advance with ESDC on putting resources to help develop the program. The turnaround time was so tight and we were of course so passionate about helping young people at this time that we got to work right away with a full risk and understanding that if this agreement did not go forward, we would be at the financial risk of doing so. We accepted that risk because we really wanted to help. So that's uh, directly from the Blues, Mr. Chair. Uh, obviously the organization made the decision on their own volition uh, to proceed on May 5th. I uh, wanted to clear that up because as I said, uh, Mr. Polyev is trying to weave things out of thin air as he often does, but leave that aside. I actually do want to go back to that meeting if I could, uh, Ms. Telford, I'm talking about the meeting where the Kielbergers both came. And I'll quote from that meeting as well. They said in their introductory remarks, I believe it was Craig Kielberger, and I'll quote him here now. As per the contribution agreement, we charity would only be reimbursed its costs to build and administer the program, he said. To be clear, there was no financial benefit for the charity. We charity would not have received any financial gain from the CSSG program, the Canada Student Service Grant program, of course, and it is incorrect to say otherwise. Ms. Telford, does that correspond with your understanding? I apologize, Mr. Chair. Something has just come up on my screen. Um, I just need someone to come and, sorry, there's a big, 
Uh, we can uh, we can see you, Miss uh, Telford, and we can uh, hear you. Uh, okay. And Mr. Fragg, okay. Scott is uh, uh, you're coming across kind of gravelly. Can you adjust your uh, mic somewhat? Did you hear what uh, Mr. Fragg Scott has said, uh, Miss Telford? Sorry, I didn't catch the last part. I had big exclamation marks flashing at me. Was... Okay. Uh, then sure, if you could I repeat the last part. Yeah, it could be the connection. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I was quoting uh, from the uh, from Craig Kielberger, who came and testified a yes. few days ago. Uh, I did. Say, I'll just repeat the statement, just because uh, I'm not sure what part you heard and what part you didn't. So he said, as per the contribution agreement, we charity would only be reimbursed its costs to build and administer the program. To be clear, there was no financial benefit for the charity. We charity would not have received any financial gain from the Canada Student Service Grant Program, and it is incorrect to say otherwise. My question to you, Ms. Telford, was whether or not that explanation matches with your understanding. I, I believe it does, yes. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I also had a question relating to um, WE's, uh, WE's network, their network of uh, being in touch with two and a half million students, uh, 7,000 schools, when uh, the public service advised that we was the would, we would be the charity uh, organization to move ahead with administering and building the uh, Canada Student Service Grant, that was a, a key reason, right? Uh, that's our understanding as a committee that has come up before. Um, can you speak to that at all? Absolutely. I mean, this this was an organization that you know despite all the things that are, are being talked about now, this was an organization that was internationally renowned, that was nationally renowned. I can tell you that my nine-year-old son knows the name of this organization and, and not from me. Um, and uh, it's, you know, there's, there's, there's a school named after a Kilberger. It is, um, this is a very large organization in this country. And uh, I'm, I'm, so it was not surprising in, in many ways to see it as being an organization that could do this. Having said that, uh, it was still surprising to see it as, uh, as a binary choice. And that is why we asked a lot of questions around it. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, final quick uh, question, uh, Mr. Fragascottis. Sure, and the question or uh, something along these lines has been asked already by Mr. McLeod. I took the opportunity earlier with the prime minister to raise it, and I've raised it before, just simply on behalf of constituents, though I, I have to ask uh, again, uh, for youth going forward, if the Canada Student Service Grant does not materialize, uh, what can members of parliament tell youth and their communities about uh, supports that will continue to be made available? Obviously, there's the Canada Emergency Student Benefit that's being accessed by so many uh, young people across the country. But in terms of further supports, that can be there for students on the one hand, but also for not-for-profits. Uh, Quick, quickly, quickly many, Mr. Fragg has got us. Many in the community that are, are reeling right now, what is the message that you would put to them? So look, I think there's a lot of other programs um, that are there to support students. And obviously there is more work to continue to do. And as I said, I know the Minister of Diversity, Inclusion and Youth is uh, is passionate about this and is working very hard uh, along with her colleagues to look at some of uh, to look at more solutions and supports for students uh, in terms of the nonprofit sector more broadly uh, or specific to youth um, and it's interesting because you know these are organizations where actually they were also used as uh, as third party organizations and um, contribution agreements uh, were organized with these organizations like the Community Foundations of Canada, the Canadian Red Cross, the United Way and Centre Aide Canada. Um, and uh, there's a lot of different, Minister Hussein has been uh, actively engaged and, and announced a number of supports for nonprofits and, and char the charitable sector as well. Okay, we will have to uh, move on to uh, Mr. A see if you can get the technology people to look at the, that mic sound there, Mr. Fragascottis. Uh, Mr. Fortin, you're Merci, on. Monsieur le Président. Uh, Madame Telford, uh, je comprends que votre rôle en tant que chef de cabinet et le rôle en, en fait de l'ensemble de votre équipe, c'est de conseiller le premier ministre. Quand on constate là, que le premier ministre là, et son ministre des Finances nous disent qu'à leur avis, ils n'auraient pas dû se prononcer là, en mai sur l'octroi du contrat à We Charity, Euh, quand on, on entend aujourd'hui qu'ils le regrettent, ils s'en excusent et que vous êtes d'accord avec eux qu'ils n'auraient pas dû se prononcer, 
Diriez-vous que vous êtes contente du travail fait par votre équipe et vous dans ce dossier-là? Look, as I said in the outset, in my uh, in my opening remarks, um, this this obviously did not go the way uh, it should have gone, and I do share in some in some responsibility for that. Of course, I do, as the person who um, who was giving advice to the prime minister. And uh, but I do the best I can with the best information I can, and that's what I'm going to keep doing uh, to help help serve and support Canadians. Vous avez eu combien de discussions avec le premier ministre entre le 8 et le 22 mai avant qu'il prenne sa décision? À ce, je parle de discussions à ce sujet-là, là, évidemment. OK. Ouais. If it was more generally, it's, I, yeah. I wouldn't be able to, I have no idea. Um, it, it's, oh, it's, been, it's been a lot during this period. Um, specifically on this subject during that period uh, from May 8th to uh, the the following cabinet meeting that it went to uh, two weeks, it was about two weeks later. Um, we we certainly had a briefing again ahead of the next cabinet meeting. And then there was another briefing, uh, I believe just before that as well, where we got, we went, we took a longer period of time to go through the details. Qui participait à ces briefings là? Uh, it's, um, pretty usual it's it's the senior officials within the privy council office as well as uh, senior staff within the prime minister's office et tous ces gens là n'ont pas pu empêcher le premier ministre de se prononcer pour octroyer un contrat à we charity le 22 mai alors qu'il reconnaît aujourd'hui qu'il aurait pas dû le faire qu'il aurait, aurait dû se récuser personne n'a réussi à le convaincre de pas le faire As I've already stated, we spent our time trying to ensure that due diligence was done on this, that this was the right thing to do to support students at that time. And uh, we we knew the facts as we knew them at the time in terms of the prime ministers um, having spoken at some events and in terms of Sophie Gregoire Trudeau's uh, connection to uh, the WE organization. And we knew that had been cleared. And so there wasn't a discussion on conflict at that time. Et que, last, le, ministre finances, question, et que le ministre des Finances avait voyagé sur le bras de WE Charity, payé par WE Charity, vous saviez ça aussi? No, we did not know that or discuss that at that time. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, thank you both. Uh, Mr. Uh, Julian, floor is uh, yours and will be followed by, if it's okay with the committee, Ms. May. Uh, Mr. Julian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Prime Minister's testimony seems to be collapsing like a house of cards. Uh, first, he said he didn't know anything. Then he said, well, we did all our due diligence, but uh, to date, we've not had a single indication of what due diligence was done. Um, this, these positions were advertised as volunteer jobs, and yet that, of course, uh, would violate uh, both minimum wage laws across the country and labor standards legislation. To what extent was due diligence done on this project, on this scheme, to actually assure that it was in conformity and uh, legal in, uh, according to minimum wage laws and to labor standards across the country? Uh, Ms. Telford. Look, a memorandum does not go to cabinet without due diligence being done, and it was then held up so that extra layers of due diligence were done to ensure that everyone felt comfortable recommending it to cabinet a second time. And as I've already said, this didn't go the way it should have gone. And uh, there are additional layers and, and question, layers of scrutiny or, or questions, uh, knowing what we know now, um, that would have, uh, would have been good to ask at the time, but we, didn't, we only knew what we knew then. Uh, has the RCMP contacted the PMO, uh, any officials in the Prime Minister's office uh, so far since the no. scandal broke? No. Okay. Je vais passer en anglais, uh, en français maintenant. Um, là, c'est la troisième fois que ça arrive. Et le premier ministre a dit après la première controverse, si j'avais à refaire ça, on aurait fait ça différemment. J'aurais parlé avec le bureau de la commissaire dès le début pour faire prouver tout ce qu'on est en train de faire et tout ce qu'on a fait. Euh, effectivement, rien de cela s'est produit. Alors, ma question est, est simplement, pourquoi? Pourquoi quand euh, supposément le premier ministre avait appris des dernières controverses, des derniers scandales, pourquoi maintenant pour la troisième fois, euh, c'est évident que toutes les procédures et toutes les lois n'ont pas été respectées? 
We talk to the ethics commissioner's office all the time, or I wouldn't be able to tell you that we received clearance from the ethics commissioner's office for the work that Sophie Gregoire Trudeau was doing with um, with the WE organization. And um, so uh, what I can tell you is that it is an office that everybody in our office respects, that we take very seriously, and that uh, we go back and forth with them on a very frequent basis. Uh, Mr. Julian? Are we having trouble? Uh, uh, non, merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, là, uh, effectivement, la question est, est bien simple. Qui est responsable au bureau du premier ministre pour s'assurer que les lois ne sont pas bafouées et que les lois sont suivies? Uh, c'est qui qui est responsable? Est-ce que c'est le premier ministre? Est-ce que c'est vous? Qui est la personne responsable pour ce bafouillage des, des lois qui gouvernent notre pays? Uh, Ms. Tilford, and uh, that'll be the uh, end of that round, uh, Mr. Julian. Ms. Tilford. So I will repeat what I stated before, which is that the Prime Minister has never received any a payment, any income of any kind from the WE organization, uh, both before and, and since becoming Prime Minister. And that was something we were clear on, that we had gone to the Ethics Commissioner in terms of the, uh, the potential involvement. We went before there was any involvement. We got it signed off ahead of time in terms of uh, Sophie's involvement, in terms of podcast, in terms of potential travel, in terms of potential expenses. And so we take those steps very seriously. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, do we have any objection to uh, to allowing uh, uh, Miss May in for uh, a couple of minutes? And who do I go to in the official opposition after her if she's allowed to uh, question? Barrett. Can I see you, Mr. Pollyer? Barrett. Barrett will go with that one. Okay. Michael Barrett. Mr. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Miss, uh, Miss May, a couple of minutes. You've been thank at every meeting. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, I just want to say for Canadians who may find it hard to believe that civil servants and cabinet ministers and everybody, including a bunch of us on the screen, work 20 hour days, seven days a week at the beginning of the pandemic. We all witnessed it. And I, I don't want to let that remark that you made, um, Ms. Telford, go out, go forward without corroboration. You guys all worked, you were killing yourselves in this period. But that doesn't mean that we can't investigate. I find it hard to believe that the prime minister was, and I'm not doubting that he did actually, I just wanna know, he seems very convinced that he thought Canada Service Corps was gonna deliver this program up till May 8th. He'd announced it on April 22nd. From the testimony of civil servants, including Rachel Warnick, we knew that they were considering we before the announcement, at least a week before the announcement. And that on May 5th, as we know, Minister Chager took it to the COVID committee, clearly putting the WE charity as the agency to deliver this. Can you explain how it's possible? Did no one want to tell the prime minister, burst his bubble, tell him his favorite uh, operation, Canada Service Corps was just not going to be able to do it? Why did no one tell him before May 8th that Canada Service Corps was out of it and WE charity was delivering the program? Ms. Uh, Telford. Um. I think, uh, to be fair, that was a question he actually had on May 8th as well, which is why it was pulled back so that he could get uh, a better understanding of things. And uh, it, it partly speaks to the, to the speed and uh, the volume of, of work during that period, as well as other, other events during that period that I know I don't need to remind anyone about. It has been an incredible time you know, above and beyond the pandemic in terms of what this country has been having to go through. And, um, I guess one thing maybe to help clarify that would be on, I believe it was April 20th, it was in the package that I was referencing earlier, it's, um, it was the very large package that came ahead of that announcement that had the nine annexes to it. Uh, on Annex 4, page 5, um, it actually talks about the Canada Summer Student uh, Grant. And in it, it talked about the need or the potential need at that point, because that was all that was written into it at that time, the potential need for a third party to be able to, um, to make this work. Uh, and it did talk about the, it gave some examples um, of delivery agent, administrator, that kind of thing. We was one of the examples in there at that time. 
Um, but it was an example of a, you know, of a potential method of doing it. So that was as far as it had come to us. So we knew people were working on these things. Canada's, the, the, the Canada Service Corps was still something in his mind and that was still in the mix. And uh, we didn't actually see the return on, on their further work on that until we saw it on May 8th. Okay, I will have to end it there. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, Thanks. sorry, but uh, um, uh, we'll go to uh, Mr. Barrett who will be followed back into five minute rounds. Uh, Mr. Barrett will be followed by Mr. Sabara. Ma'am, you said a handful of people spoke to we before the agreement was announced. You've given one name. Who are the other four? I already said there was some there was some communication staff around the time of the uh, around the time of of what was a what was a big announcement and a launch. So it's perfectly normal for communication staff to go back and what, forth. What were their names, ma'am? I said I said I would look into that for you. So you commit today to provide those names to the committee and the dates on which they communicated with the WE organization? I will look into it. I can consult with folks. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Polyev. This is information the committee is entitled to receive. The witness knows the names. Uh, if she didn't, she wouldn't be able to enumerate how many there were. Uh, she is obliged to answer the question. Okay. I'm going to ask that you uh, require that answer right now. The names of PMO staffers who spoke with we. No need for a cover up. I I, I believe uh, Ms. Tilford is agreeing to provide us with the names when she looks at her records. Uh, the point correct? of order, Mr. Chair. Yeah. That's not what we've been told. Okay, then I'll ask for clarification from Ms. Uh, Telford. Can she provide us the uh, the committee the names uh, after she looks at her records? It's Ms. just to be clear, Mr. Chair, it's it's not my records. Um, I will need to go and consult <laughs> with with the individuals involved, and I would I would really ask the members that uh, I am here on the staff's behalf and happy to take any questions that they have for them. Uh, I I I uh, I think the uh, the question was a little more than that. I'll go to Mr. Barrett while we think about this for a moment, Mr. Barrett. Well, um, ma'am. You're, you're required to, to disclose this information. It's, it's, a, it's a necessary for us to know. This is why we have things like a lobbyist registry. We need to know who has contacted whom and, and on what dates. This is germane to this, this study. It's germane to the committee's work. And I'm gonna ask you again to commit that you will provide the names and the dates of the communication. Uh, I would uh, as well uh, point out, uh, Ms. Tilford, I believe the uh, clerk of the privy, there is a, a request from the committee for documents uh, that was uh, was carried and the uh, clerk of the Privy Council had committed to uh, to get those documents. I'm not sure if these are in them or not, but I believe that is where we're at. Uh, Ms. Telford. So just to be clear, I didn't enumerate as was alleged earlier that uh, the exact number of staff, I said there you was said a, a handful, handful and usually of that means five. Just... Yes, sorry. Go, go ahead, Ms. Telford, before you're interrupted. Um, so yes, in and around that number, and uh, there was only the one prior to around the time of the launch. Around the time of the launch, there was um, some back and forth, usual media relations kinds of check-ins. Do you know the names of any other individuals who are in the room? I would want to check before I give them to committee. Okay, Mr. Uh, Barrett. So how are we only learning today that the Prime Minister came and pulled the agreement from Cabinet on May 8th? We've had testimony from uh, the Clerk of the Privy Council, from multiple ministers, including Minister Chagger, Minister Morno, uh, and the Prime Minister up until today has not said that. How is it that you've just saved this amazing story for today? When you say the Prime Minister just said that, well, the Prime Minister was only just a witness at your committee, um, and he was happy to provide this information, as am I. I believe also that the clerk of the Privy Council did make reference to the questions I was asking around this and the, the due diligence around this that we were um, that we were pushing on. Uh, yes, he, he did, Mr. Barrett. He, he did not say that the Prime Minister pulled it, correct? Uh, no, I believe what he said was due diligence. Ms. Uh, Ms. Telford. I'm not certain uh, what the clerk said to, to the committee other than I do know that he, uh, he made reference to the due diligence that we had asked for. In your office, are people typically held responsible for errors? Like who, who in government do you think uh, has been held responsible for the errors that led to where we are today? Look, as I've already said, um, this is, uh, this obviously didn't roll out in the way that we would have liked. 
And uh, there's, there's a number of us, including myself, who share in that responsibility. If this committee ordered all communications, emails, and text between PMO and we, would you comply with that order? Like this was a commitment made by uh, your government when you came to office that uh, that that the PMO would would release this inf this type of information freely. Will you hide behind cabinet confidences and the Access to Information Act, or will you uh, disclose this information? Mr. Baird, I would have to seek advice on what I can and can't uh, when it comes to cabinet confidences. Uh, Mr. The Baird, domain last question. Uh, I, I should have about a minute and a half left, Mr. Chair. Uh, there were substantial interruptions and clarifications there, but uh, I want to help.org is the name of a website to apply for the CSSG. So did the government create this website or was it created by we? And the reason I ask, ma'am, is on the April 22nd announcement, it mentions the I want to help platform twice, which is the origin of I want to help. So, so what I'm looking for is the origin of the I want to help uh, branding, because in that April 22nd announcement, it includes branding from the company we. Ms. Telford, and you will have one more question. You are correct, uh, there was interruptions. Uh, Ms. Telford, uh, if you'd answer that and we'll go to one more question from Mr. Barrett. Uh, sorry, I, I don't know the answer to that. Well, in fairness, ma'am, I'd ask that you commit to undertaking to provide that answer uh, to, to the committee. And, and I guess my last question would be that between those dates that, that you mentioned uh, before and were referenced by, by one of the other members, um, what between May 8th and May 24th, uh, what allowed you and the prime minister to take this project from yellow to green? Um, ha having the opportunity to have a longer conversation with senior officials and senior staff around um, why it did come back the way that it, it did. Um, as per one of your colleagues in the committee's question earlier, uh, there had been uh, different thoughts around what this might look like when it was first discussed. And so we wanted to have a better understanding of that. We also wanted to have an understanding that all the T's had been crossed and the I's had been dotted, as you know, as the clerk said. That's why we were asking uh, questions around due diligence and making sure that the, also that it was the right um, method to do this. So not only was it the right organization, but that uh, entering into this contribution agreement was the right way to do it, and we were okay. assured that it was. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you both, uh, Mr. Sabero. You have uh, five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the committee members for asking all these insightful questions today. Uh, Ms. Telford, thank you. Nice to see you this afternoon. Um, first, uh, first question, um, what process is in place uh, in the office, in your office, um, in relation to consulting on issues of ethics? So when... Um... When staff start here, and oftentimes before they start in these roles, uh, it was certainly the case in, in my situation, and I know in others, we uh, sit down with um, either the ethics commissioner themselves, uh, as was the case for me in 2015, or, um, or with one of the, uh, one of the officers in the ethics commissioner's office to go through what all of the different considerations are in starting these positions. Um, there's a number of other documents. We actually, we have a, um, a head of HR and they make sure that there's a number of other documents that are reviewed by staff and uh, when they're starting so that they're onboarded appropriately. And we encourage all staff um, all the time to take uh, all ethical matters extremely seriously. We are in privileged seats serving Canadians here and, and not only now, but at any time, these are incredibly, um, these are incredibly, we're all very privileged to be uh, and honored to be in the roles that we're in serving Canadians. And so we take that very seriously and we encourage everyone when they've got a question to check, to ask, to go to the ethics commissioner, uh, to talk to one of the senior staff about it and we can help them if we know any, any history on it. But, but ultimately it's always, you know, that we try to go to the ethics commissioner when we can to get clarification or to go to the Privy Council office. Um, but, uh, but, most importantly, it is ensuring that everyone is onboarded properly and that uh, we follow all of the different interpretations and advice that comes from the Ethics Commissioner's office. And when we're not sure, we check. Okay. Mr. Severa. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Ms. Telford, for that uh, very clear answer. Um, in terms of due diligence, because the word due diligence has come up uh, quite a bit, and you know, 
our government has put in place uh, a number of programs that are helping Canadians from coast to coast to coast. And if we see, you know, the, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, which is being delivered through the Canada Revenue Agency, or we see the Canada Emergency Business Account, which is being uh, delivered through our financial institutions, everything from small credit unions to the, the, the big banks. And then we see uh, programs uh, like the Emergency Community Support Fund, which is being delivered through the United Way and various partner agencies. So obviously there is a level of due diligence that is done by government and by governmental officials that is higher. You know, you're dealing with the CRA, an agency that's well known to the government, part of the government, but then you're dealing with the United Way or, or, or organizations in this place, volunteer organizations where we receive recommendations from government officials, public servants who've done a phenomenal job for Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Uh, and the, but the due diligence on our part is, is, is higher because we are dealing with third parties. We're not dealing with directly with governmental organizations. So I'd like to understand that, that process and just looking at the due, dil due diligence when it refers to uh, third party organizations and how important it was for the prime minister, for yourself, for others around cabinet to ask those tougher questions with the information that's being presented to you when we were looking at third party organizations. Well, I think you just touched on exactly, you know, why we paused. Um, and as someone else described it, you know, went from went from yellow to green, um, and uh, or perhaps went from from green to yellow. It had already uh, it had already gone from the cabinet committee, uh, and was heading toward cabinet for ratification when when we actually turned it to yellow, and um, part of the reason was because this for, for the reasons you said it was a third party organization, and we wanted to make sure that everybody was perfectly comfortable with it. Um, that the public service truly was recommending it as the way to go, and they stood by that recommendation over the over the coming two weeks. Um, but I, I think it's all the reasons that you're saying that it's really important, and you know I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of reviewing done in the coming in the coming weeks and months um, to make sure that you know every um, that, that as much due diligence as necessary is always done on these 30, third party organizations. But at the time. The assurances were given that this was the right organization to proceed with. Yeah. Last question, uh, Mr. Severo. No, and, and in terms of of moving forward, and I think about the the number of of youth across Canada that had signed up for this program and how important it was for them to sign up. And I see, and I've read from some of the statistics that over 50% came from communities, marginalized communities, called the racialized communities, whichever you, uh, term that you you would prefer. And, and and it's it is disappointing to now know that that we you know we had to hit the pause button on this program. Other programs are running in place, and, and I'm glad that we have expanded the Canada. We did expand the Canada Summer Jobs Offering uh, Youth, uh, extra 60 million dollars into that program. Uh, but uh, I do hope that you know going forward that we can you know restart a, a similar type of program where youth are, are invited to apply, get that volunteer experience because we know how valuable and enriching. That, that volunteer experience is for them. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Ms. Tilford. Um, well, I, I hope the same. Uh, and I know there are people that are working very, very hard on it. Um, it is really important. As I said, there were kind of two jobs as we saw it when we talked about youth and, and young people and students uh, back on April 5th, which feels a lot longer ago now than the date implies. Um, but uh, when we talked at that time, you know, job one was making sure that we got students, uh, which we which we did to the best of our ability, get students the support they needed to be able to pay rent, to be able to put groceries on the table. And then number two was finding ways um, through existing programs, as well as potentially through some new programs, which this was hoping to be, to be able to allow young people to stay connected to their communities to even have an experience that they might not otherwise have during this pandemic. Okay, uh, Ms. Tilford, we will uh, thank you for your testimony. We have now reached the uh, two hours that we asked you to come and you, uh, and you accept it. We're a little over it actually. Uh, so we'll uh, thank you for your, uh, for your testimony uh, today. Um, uh, and I would also, uh, before we close off certainly like to uh, to thank the uh, translators uh, library of parliament uh, folks who have worked uh, so uh, due diligently this uh, this week uh, in order to uh, make all these meetings that we've had uh, possible so with that miss uh, Tilford uh, 
uh, you're free to uh, free to go. Um, are we uh, ready to close uh, the uh, the meeting? Point Mr. of order. Uh, yeah. Point of yeah. order, Mr. Chair. Um, the uh, I'd like to make a motion um, that uh, the committee ask the Prime Minister's office to release the names of all of the staff members that spoke to the WE organization. Uh, to the Kielberger brothers, to any affiliates of the We or, uh, of the We organization, after May, uh, after March the first. Uh, okay, the uh, the motion uh, is, I uh, believe, in order, Madam Clerk. Uh, I believe it's in order. Uh, I see, uh, Mr. Go ahead. Can you repeat it so that I can have it for the record? Okay. Could yes. you uh, uh, repeat it fairly slowly, uh, Mr. Polyev? Uh, that uh, the Prime Minister's office uh, release to the committee by the end of the next calendar week, the names of all Prime Minister's office staff members who communicated with the We Charity, the Kielberger Brothers, any or any affiliates of the We Charity since March the 1st, and that the PMO provide the dates and dates, participants, and contents of those meetings. Okay, the motion is on the floor. You have got that, I uh, assume, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, and uh, do you uh, do you want to speak to it further, uh, Mr. Polyev, or will I go to Mr. Julian? Well, I'll speak very briefly. I think there should be no controversy about this uh, issue. Uh, the uh, chief of staff uh, was asked repeatedly, she said, uh, as, as to whether or not there were PMO staffers who spoke to the WE organization uh, in the period in question. And she said, yes, there was. Uh, yes, there were, excuse me. Uh, there, were, there was a handful of staff members in the prime minister's office, uh, a handful she later defined to be five, who spoke to the Kielbergers uh, during the period in question, but then she said she would not release their names uh, and she did not release a chronology of the dates of their conversations, nor did she release the content of their conversations. Um, so obviously we need to know this because the entire government's entire case is that this whole strange program was dreamed was dreamt up by the public service with no involvement or influence by public by the political uh, or uh, arm of the government or, or the staff of the um, prime minister uh, but if these conversations occurred then that might contradict it finally the uh, lobbying act requires that all of these interactions be registered um, and uh, we have no registry of any such conversations so we need to find out if the lobbying act uh, was violated uh, in uh, the course of these uh, conversations. Thank you. Okay, uh, just uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Julian, uh, and and uh, go ahead, Mr. Julian. I'm just thinking out loud. I was wondering if these are already include, included in the clerk of the Privy Council's correspondence. But go ahead, Mr. Julian. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be supporting the motion, but I'm offering a friendly amendment to Mr. Polyev. Uh, so he has disappeared. Hopefully he will come back on in just a moment uh, that we include the cabinet uh, memos with the uh, recommendations on we for the May 8th and May 22nd cabinet meetings. Uh, Mr. Uh, 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 is that a, a, a friendly uh, uh, amendment, uh, Mr. Polyev? Uh, you're muted. I love Sorry. that, but you go ahead. <laughs> ah! <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chair. <laughs> uh, it is a friendly amendment. Okay. Uh, then, uh, Madam Clerk, I expect you got that as amended. I uh, see uh, Mr. 
Mr. Uh, Francesco, Mr. Severa's uh, hand up, and who else was yelling? Anybody else want in? Before we move on, sir, can I yep. just make sure that that's in addition to the end of the motion? Correct, okay. And uh, can I just to get it right, including the cabinet memos for May 8th and May 22nd? Concerning the WE recommendations. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I have uh, Mr. Uh, Sabaro, uh, and uh, if there's anybody else, uh, let me know. Let me, okay, and Mr. Zerowitz, Mr. Mr. Sabaro. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and as we, we sit here, and I believe it's the fourth or fifth hour of, uh, consecutively on, on, on the second day, and this afternoon, obviously, we had uh, testimony from uh, the Prime Minister of Canada, who came for 90 minutes to committee and, and answered uh, many questions and and I thought uh, clarified many many issues uh, and and that I wanted to hear about and we also now had the um, uh, chief of staff to the prime minister come to committee for two hours uh, answer uh, many questions to provide uh, clarity to 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 many of the issues that were have been raised and and asked and questions asked uh, it just seems to me that with this uh, motion that's uh, being put forward by um, MP Polyev and with an, uh, an amendment by NDP, it's 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 uh, if I can call it scraping at the bottom of the barrel, uh, you know, going after uh, like a witch hunt for junior staff members uh, and so forth. You had today uh, the Prime Minister and, and the Chief of Staff here at committee answering questions, and it, it seems like this is a is a more of if I can call it desperation scraping at the barrel again. And, and that's that's my view of it, uh, uh, plain and simple. We've, we've heard testimony over the last several weeks, um, extensive testimony about the program, about how the program came about, the recommendation that was provided uh, via for a third party, uh, that it, it went to cabinet, that further uh, questions were asked. And, and this to me uh, is an unnecessary uh, scraping at the bottom of the barrel uh, by the opposition. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I have uh, Ms. Uh, Zerowitz, and is there anybody beyond uh, that before I go to the uh, question? Ms. Zerowitz, you're on, and then we'll see who will see if anybody raises their hand. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, literally, I think Mr. Sarbar was reading my brain. Uh, I was going to say the exact same words. This is a desperate attempt. Uh, after not being able, after we've completed very thoroughly investigating what the original motion, the intention of the original motion, proving that there's been no misspending of any money, proving that it's been responsibly signed, uh, responsibly negotiated, responsibly selected, that there's been no interference uh, by the prime minister, by any cabinet minister. It's been suggested uh, by uh, the uh, civil servants. Uh, they have done an excellent job, a responsible job, and it's unfortunate that we have the ending right now, but it seems like that in the desperate attempt of the conservatives to keep this alive somehow in the media, somehow they need to continue to keep the media, that they're scraping the bottom of the barrel. I will also point out that on there was a motion put forward by Mr. Julian on Thursday, July the 2nd, we discussed it a few days later, that already includes all the, re that all the relevant information around the uh, uh, the decision from uh, We Charity and Me to We and the design and creation of the Canada Student Service Grant, the written correspondence, uh, everything from March 2020 onward um, is going to be provided no later than August the 8th. I think uh, all of that information will be provided. I think that will uh, be able to validate everything that we have heard uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks and over five, uh, uh, five meetings. And so I just don't understand uh, why uh, there is a need for this motion today. So I will not be supporting it. Okay. Um, all uh, right. Uh, is there anyone else? Or are we ready for the uh, question? Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Fraser, then you will uh, probably wrap it up. Uh, certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I might just add my voice to to some of my colleagues. Uh, th there's two points in particular that I, I find uh, uh, rub me the wrong way when it comes to uh, the proposed motion. 
Uh, I think uh, chiefly my concern is about the uh, precedent it would set to start bringing more junior staff within political offices than those we've already heard testify. Uh, the Prime Minister of Canada and his Chief of Staff were here during this meeting. Uh, I've seen what happened uh, when we had civil servants who were brought before this committee and, and badgered in a manner that I think uh, is the kind of thing that will cause civil servants to more uh, broadly uh, be careful about giving open and honest feedback to governments. Uh, I don't appreciate the, uh, the practice that this committee has implemented in their treatment of certain witnesses. I think we will potentially go down the same path uh, should we continue to uh, pull more junior and junior staff as, uh, as witnesses in this testimony. Uh, second, uh, the point that I, I also want to raise is the fact that we don't actually have any evidence that there's uh, been an effort by anyone in, uh, at a political level uh, to influence the workings of the civil service. If I had heard evidence to that testimony, uh, I would think otherwise. Uh, starting to request uh, documents that are subject to cabinet confidence when there's no evidence whatsoever that they will suggest uh, what the uh, the opposition has been hinting they might suggest, uh, I don't think is a useful exercise for the purpose of this committee. Uh, for that reason, I, I won't be supporting the motion. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, then uh, maybe uh, Mr. Julian is going to wrap it up. Mr. Julian. I seen your hand up. Yeah, th th thanks, Mr. Mr. Chair. I mean, throughout this, the last three weeks, I, it's true, I sponsored the original motion. Uh, we've been hit by uh, revelation after revelation, things that were, were told to us that were supposedly um, uh, facts that turned out to be very, very different. And that's why this scandal has exploded. So for for any member of this committee to say, well, we don't want to go any further because we may un un uncover other contradictions, other um, uh, dis dishonesty within uh, what we have been told originally and what Canadians have been told, I, I think um, would, would not be doing the due diligence that we as a committee need to undertake. We need to get that information. We need to get these answers for Canadians. It's, it's very clear uh, that as this has gone along, uh, a massive amount of, of uh, revelations have come in around the finance minister, around the prime minister's involvement, and around the complete lack of due diligence in this mess. So I, I can understand the Liberals putting on a partisan hat and saying, well, we don't want to get any further information. But uh, we do have a responsibility, all of us, to get that information and to compare the facts so that we actually uh, know what what has actually occurred. And uh, I, I, that's why I'm supporting the motion. I think we have to do that due diligence. It did not happen in the government. Our responsibility okay. as parliamentarians is to perform that due diligence. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, if we could uh, go to a recorded uh, vote, the, uh, the list is in your hands. I'm going to unmute myself here. Um, okay, so first, Ms. Sarowitz. No. Mr. Freshes Kados. No. Mr. Fraser. No. Ms. Katrakis. No. Mr. McLeod. No. Mr. Poliev. Yes. Mr. Cooper. Yes. Mr. Cumming. Yes. Mr. Morantz. Yes. Mr. Fortin. Oui. Mr. Julian. Yes. Uh, the yeas have it. Okay, uh, then the uh, motion is carried and that information will be uh, passed uh, uh, forward, uh, so uh, uh, we in a position to adjourn. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Uh, I promise this will be my last one. Uh, I just wanted to uh, to thank you for your good work uh, throughout this meeting. I, I know it was a, a tough meeting to chair, uh, and uh, you did a fine job. I was happy to help in my own small way where it was possible. <laughs> and um, I want to let you know if there's ever a, a big storm again out in PEI, uh, you can give me a call. I'd be glad to come out and help you through it again. <laughs> Any blessings uh, to you. All right. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, it was a big storm. Uh, first time I got blacked out. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, then I thank, uh, again, I do want to thank the uh, Library of Parliament people because I know they've been doing yeoman's work. Uh, thank you, you, Madam Clerk, and all the other clerks who have helped us this week, the, the interpreters. 
Uh, and I do know we got a, a steering committee meeting tomorrow as well. Uh, but uh, in any event, thank you uh, one and all and thank the members for their efforts this week. With that, meeting adjourned. Thank you all.